Good morning, Steph and David. Hey, good morning. Hello, Mark. Good morning. Yes, good morning. I had an unexpected change just three minutes ago that uh, I moved my meeting that I had a conflict, so I'm able to join from the beginning. So I'm happy to join. Ah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks was, a lot. Sure. Good morning, Steph. I'm here as well. It's Monica. Hey, hey Monica. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Uh, I think we're still waiting for maybe for some colleagues from SEAT. Let's give it uh, one or two more minutes before we before we start. So I'm going to show how bad my Spanish is, but what are cimientos in the title here? Cimientos. Como construimos los cimientos para promover? What are cimientos? That's Foundations. Great. Foundations. Yeah, we build the ground. The ground for the base. Yeah. Uh, Foundations. Kind of cement, no, it's oh, kind okay. of the, like okay. the foundations. The foundations, okay. Yeah. All right, uh, thanks for the help on that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the foundations is much better. Oh, okay. Yeah. The grounds is more in terms of buildings, uh, construction buildings, all that, but. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yes, and uh, just in case uh, there is simultaneous translation, Mark. Yes, let's start. Let's start. Uh, uh, let's start, David. Please go okay. ahead. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of this workshop. And as we were wondering at the beginning, how we can build these foundations to promote um, low carbon um, farming. Last week, we were talking a little bit about what are those guidelines? What are the opportunities and difficulties we have, particularly on uh, low, uh, um, small, small farmers? that had to do with uh, uh, food and, and, and farming with uh, cereals in Mexico and potato in the Andes. And we're going to talk about other systems that uh, have interesting challenges too. Before explaining the program today and the basic instructions, you can listen to this in English or Spanish. We have simultaneous interpreting. You have uh, the interpreting function uh, with the globe icon at the right bottom of your screen. You can uh, click on um, the the icon, which is uh, a, a world, uh, uh, and uh, you can choose English or Spanish. And uh, I'd like to remind you that when we, when someone's speaking, um, turn off your cameras and microphones. Each uh, lecturer will have 15 minutes to talk about what we were going, we're going to talk today. You can put your comments in the chat box. You have the chat icon too. And when we have um, the Q and A session, uh, you can raise your hand if you want to talk. Also. Uh, these are the basic instructions. I'm going to share today's agenda. Let me uh, share my screen very briefly for today. We have uh, our first uh, participation from our colleagues from Bayer and SIP. 
Then we'll, we're going to talk uh, about microfinance and uh, pastoral systems. In block four, we're going to uh, talk about cacao in Colombia with two lectures. And finally, we'll have a facilitated debate, which will start with uh, two panelists, Erika Serrano uh, in Abericibon. And this is what we have prepared for today. And just to recap and um, go ahead, I'd like to pass the floor to Monica McBride. She is in the unit of environment and uh, landscape of Bayer. Monica, you have the floor. Great, thank you, David, and thank you all for joining today. Um, so I, I'll, I will keep this short. Um, I think some of you were on the call last week, um, but just to set the scene for those who weren't, um, the purpose of these right shops has really been to crystallize and bring together all of the information that um, the the SIP and the CIMIT groups have been working on over the past year to understand if there are opportunities for smallholder farmers to participate in carbon markets, specifically for three different cropping systems. So maize in Mexico, um, potatoes in Peru and um, cocoa in Colombia. And so over the past year, the team has been doing research into what are the leading practices that could be implemented to actually sequester carbon or reduce emissions, which is required for the generation of these credits. So we have now a list of those practices, how um, how much we think they can reduce and really impact um, overall C carbon balance within the system. And so that was presented on the last call um, for, for potatoes. And we are also um, looking at, and what was presented on the last call was an overview of then how do you actually translate that information and those reductions into the actual credit market. And so there was a presentation of what the current credit market looks like overall at a global scale and then with some deep dives on um, specific projects within the value chain that are happening within um, those countries as well and so we got a good overview of those two sides of the, the coin and then we, we kind of wrapped up the session with an understanding from some external experts of what they think is needed in the space to ensure these farmers are profitable, are sustainable from an environmental perspective, um, and also have a, a good living um, wage and, and living conditions. And so it was a really valuable first session to really set the stage for what needs to be included in this white paper that we are ultimately aiming towards with these um, three different sessions. And so I'm looking forward to kind of diving a little bit deeper today into some of the other cropping systems and looking at uh, more of these, again, like these global trends and global issues with our external experts. Um, so that's that's all I had, Steph. I, think you might be next. I think Mark wasn't able to join the first presentation, so I'm going to bring him up to speed um, on that, and he's looking forward to participating today. Gracias, gracias, Monica. Y sí, me gustaría también eh, dar yes, la palabra. Yes, thank you very much, Monica. I'd like to pass the floor to Mark Edge, who is with us. He's a director of a commercial uh, Yeah, so just a few short words. Oh, because sale Monica, of seeds uh, from Bayer. Yeah, okay, just a few short words because I don't have much to add to that. I'm sorry I missed the first session, but this has been an ongoing process together with the CG system working at this. And I think all I can say is, is that as we try to develop technologies for farmers around the world, and there's so much focus on carbon markets for um, commercial farmers, um, my focus is trying to shorten the gap of when it gets to smallholder farmers. And so I think this is very important from a standpoint of um, getting technologies and innovations and things to smallholder farmers in, in low and middle income countries uh, at a faster pace where they can 
take advantage of this and increase their productivity and, and contribute to in, improving the environmental impact of agriculture on this. So first of all, just kudos to all of you and the work that's being done on this. And we welcome the opportunity to work with the CG on this and, and really get some guidance about what can be impactful for smallholder farmers. Um, and so I just turn it over to you and we'll be listening most of today, the session here today to learn and to contribute on that. But uh, Monica is our resident expert on this. And so I don't pretend to um, fill in for, for what she knows on all of this, but I really appreciate the opportunity to listen in and contribute uh, however I can. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to um, back to David or to Steph. Thank you. Gracias, gracias, Mark. Uh, sí, uh, thank you very well, much, Mark. Well, just a few words uh, from Seth Han, our senior scientist in agro-food uh, systems and leader of this initiative, Steph. I think Mark and Monica already did an um, excellent introduction and, and recap. Uh, maybe just to remind uh, everybody on the call that the objective of last week's meeting and today's meeting is to kind of give an overview of, of what we know, where we are, uh, and this serves as an input for the white paper. So the white paper uh, next uh, or tomorrow we will have uh, with the core group uh, one uh, session to structure the paper. And then the coming weeks we will be uh, looking at papers, looking at the presentations and the references made in the presentations to actually write a position paper between the three CG centers in Latin America and, and the Bayer team uh, with a roadmap towards 2030. You know, and we really think this is a unique uh, process between the, the private sector and the three CG centers. Uh, so we're really excited uh, about that. And then today, uh, David already mentioned a little bit the program. We are cheating a little bit. Uh, so we, we thought we can, of course, we can look at, at three important crops, uh, but maybe we also have to look at some uh, other aspects. So today we also have something about microfinance and something uh, about uh, livestock and pastoral systems. So again, an exciting session ahead. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Muchas gracias, Steph. Muy bien, entonces. Thank you very much, Steph. So we're going to start with our block three. Uh, this is the case of microfinance and pastoral systems. I'd like to introduce our lecturer, Andrea Castellanos. She is senior uh, researcher in the Climate uh, Action and the Biodiversity Theater Alliance. Andrea Castellanos is an economist uh, and she um, is specialized in uh, financial economics uh, from uh, Pontificia Universidad Javeriana from Cali. And she has studied data to, uh, towards um, continuous improvement in the organization. Andrea is going to talk about scientific information and integral development of uh, microfinancial services for small farmers in Latin America. Andrea, you have the floor. You're bueno, welcome. Buenos dias. Well, eh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Listo, perfecto. Y también, si ya and also, ver, if eh, you can see my screen. Sí, la podemos ver y en modo presentación. Adelante, Andrea. Listo, perfecto. Bueno, buenas, yes, eh, okay. buenos días a todos. Well, Muchísimas good morning. gracias por Good por morning to you all. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure eh, to be with esta you mañana. today. Qué gusto saludarte, Steph, David, verlos de nuevo. I'm glad to see you, Steph and David. See eh, our friends como ya from Siming and Steve. Como ya David mencionó, mi nombre es Andrea Castellanos. Hago parte My name is Andrea Castellanos. I'm part of the Biodiversity Senior de la Equipo de Acción Climática. And I'm a senior researcher in the Climate Action Team there. I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience eh, working de, de with microfinance institutions, principalmente proveyendo información mainly científica para diseño integral de servicios providing scientific para information to en design Latina. financial bien, services eh, for small farmers in Latin America. I know this workshop has been uh, geared much towards eh, como uh, mitigation. Dice, eh, yes, Steph says we have brought additional topics to this eh, debate. And the entry point here is adaptation, but also eh, how adaptation eh, and mitigation 
en este proceso. Go hand Contarles in hand in un poco sobre eh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the types of climate action we are in. We are mainly focused in developing sound, science, and adaptation and mitigation. Um, with three main objectives, deblocking uh, public and private finance and drive change towards action that will tackle with this climate emergency. This uh, climate action team works in these different uh, thematic axes and I'm going to focus on finance and investment vis-a-vis the climate uh, crisis. We have worked with microfinance institutions in the region, but this access is very much fed by the experience of food systems, low carbon systems, um, digital agriculture, um, and we have gathered several experiences that we have put to the service of small farmers in the region. So, first of all, I'd like to tell you about this experience. We provided technical uh, advisory in the design of an EF fund uh, for Latin America. This uh, investment fund was aimed at microfinance and small farmers in four countries, Honduras, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Guatemala. The entry point of that fund was to improve productivity and adaptation of small farmers in these four countries. This fund is de dólares, $32 million, eh, donde parte de, de esos 32 millones son para la asistencia million eh, y la contribución de parte aid. nuestra eh, fue precisamente en de la asistencia técnica. Eh, porque aid, porque encontramos que habían unos desafíos y que las instituciones de microfinanza eh, carecían de uh, estos productos de adaptación al cambio climático para atender a los adaptación eh, principalmente no existía so tampoco un desarrollo uh, de una utilización de las carteras o de los portafolios de prácticas de agricultura sostenible hasta el clima eh, que, que fueran potencialmente financiadas por estas instituciones eh, de microfinanza. Entonces, ¿cuál fue so generally, uh, what was our solution here at CGIA? Uh, are, we have uh, resources, so they went to uh, the field, got information from uh, microfinance institutions and farmers also, and did a comprehensive analysis of the market and the technical aid for this fund. And we que ayudarán uh, a los pequeños eh, agricultores a encontrar esos, help eh, small farmers esos retos que les impone el clima. Pero aquí algo muy importante eh, es que Now, si bien el punto de entrada es que siempre se buscó que en donde fuera posible tuviéramos esos co-beneficios eh, de investigación, porque estamos convencidos que a través de la investigación pueden ir juntos y que hay un gran potencial para, para trabajar en el mundo to work on these two eh, bueno, topics together. What was our value added um, field visit and market eh, validation? And also de the development of tools and procedures to reach these objectives in para, para terms of adaptation. So here I summarize our methodology. Six eh, steps, de datos en campo, eh, data collection in the field, there we characterize eh, microfinance institutions, we identify the main threats and vulnerabilities in, in terms of climate, uh, what were eh, the de, um, de adaptation de option potentials, and when I mean options, these eh, are practices, que, que technologies, que and services that would allow farmers eso, to adapt in a better way, eh, then we analyze the, the data in the light of these main uh, climate vulnerabilities, but also in terms of possible negative effects of those vulnerabilities on productivity, um, um, Realizamos una priorización de una opción de adaptación por supuesto para poder eh, realizar el estudio. Con base en eso diseñamos un base upon that we de, de prácticas y tecnologías, unos uh, portafolios que llamamos eh, nosotros donde podíamos ver 
Con ese um, there, cuál es amenaza with those portfolios, estábamos, we could eh, take a look at uh, the los climate uh, threats we eh, were going to tackle de with de and, de and de what would be the effects eh, in terms eh, of um, yields Después, and benefits in their crops. We also did uh, cost-benefit analysis. This is very important. This is important. This is an economic analysis uh, about these practices. We know they have some benefits in terms of adaptation and mitigation, but these practices have to be cost-efficient. Uh, Therefore, uh, we had some uh, economic indicators that help us understand what were the most profitable or more cost-efficient practices to uh, face um, climate vulnerabilities. We also designed um, the monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, this is very important because uh, they are necessary for microfinancial institutions. They need to understand when these practices are working and when they are not. And este marco um, puede I ser, will show you that this framework con, can con be very simple y unas muy with a few eh, actions and practices. A, a hacer un marco que, and uh, que it can also be que a, 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 that includes measurements para, para uh, with some kind of suelo, technology eh, to measure cosas. Y finalmente, uh, soil, eh, pero no humidity and other things. Una and de also, we link how those portfolios were contributing eh, de to the sustainable de development de objectives, eh, the adaptation funds, um, eh, decided, decided to have some large indicators, indicators and we um, applied those indicators to the eh, portfolios to see if they were contributing eh, to sustainable de development de because we think that all these interventions a, a should holistically eh, contribute to our commitments in terms Entonces, of climate aquí, change. Un poco para here, um, lo que, this lo que este visually este tool, summarizes our analysis, ahí, and eh, here you can see cultivos, eh, the main país, crops eh, cultivos, per country. Eh, anuales, perenes, we have annual eh, or perennial casos, crops, eh, and in some eh, cases we have livestock. Pequeños or eh, um, animal husbandry, and also, we could also see eh, climate uh, threats and adaptation measures, the adaptation measures that were prioritized, these eh, were 16 here, and for si which countries eh, and crops, aplicaban, and y if uh, they were esos, eh, animals, and uh, how, de, um, what de, the uh, de effects were in terms eh, of uh, losses o los efectos de, de esa adaptación. También, pues, muy importante or lack poder of adaptation. It was also very important to eh, characterize aquí, pues, microfinance institutions. Eh, Here you have an example crédito, of how the credit portfolio eh, was uh, made up ¿no? ahí, and ahí which were the farmers. We eh, analyzed the lesson eh, there is big. Uh, uh, all farmers eh, are, are different. Eh, there can be farmer type of course, para, and we para esos were, tipos, uh, de what we were proposing should work eh, for those types of uh, eh, farmers that were uh, being attended to by microfinance uh, organizations. Eh, These are the portfolios, and as I said, eh, we clima, también, que um, era lo que podía indicated causar esa vulnerabilidad uh, que es what lo que ustedes pueden ver aquí en efecto y cuáles eran esas medidas uh, de adaptación y mitigación que were eh, habíamos elegido para contrarrestar estos efectos y cuáles eran eh, esos resultados en términos de, de rendimiento pero también de evitar esas, esas pérdidas para cada uno de los portafolios por supuesto se hizo un análisis por todo el equipo que se podía eh, indicar que tanto benefit analysis that would indicate us um, how cost efficient that uh, portfolio was at large and also the monitoring and evaluation um, measures uh, designed that could be basic just to 
or um, visit a, by a professional uh, that could observe and note la, down progress made la, or uh, something la, more complex, la necesidad, pues, including de, the need de tipo de for some kind of también, additional costos. tools that eh, implied a higher cost as well. Eh, the uh, results in terms of the cost-benefit analysis eh, is that finally all the options we submitted were profitable in terms of, of infrastructure, they were enough to cover the de loan and the tener, additional eh, maintenance costs. Like, for example, the internal uh, return rate, which was higher, uh, than 50 percent, so it was highly profitable de, de agua que estas if implemented with a better use of water water. and also uh, uh, a high Entonces, internal uh, IRR. Um, en términos and this is, uh, que tener this shows you the economic analysis and such an exercise. This eh, is a bit um, que es uno busy, de los but uh, más and this is a very de, important de result. Que and we go from estudio, the smallest eso, things we did in the study to how uh, sustainable development objectives Necesitamos, eh, um, que las acciones are mapped, so eh, actions are not isolated, and we can contribute sumando, to those eh, objectives, I mean sustainable Ahí, development by mapping different eh, actions. Ejemplo, There we identify three categories, uh, improving um, livelihoods, more resilience, eh, uh, and sustainability of these farmers. Eh, or some eh, las categorizamos para las eh, prácticas that que were classed eh, for the 16 practices eh, that were prioritized and taking a look at the uh, targets that we had predetermined para que and also how they would be measured so they could contribute with the SDGs, identifying eh, which were the SDGs we were contributing to. This is the first experience I wanted to uh, tell you. I have just two minutes. I wanted to tell you also about an experience we have that is called Scale for Resilience. This is part of um, the United Nations uh, Champions uh, Resilience uh, Initiative for Climate Change. Um, here we see the need to increase funding for adaptation. Although the Paris Agreement states that 50% of funding has to go to mitigation and 50% to adaptation, um, actually most goes to mitigation and so, not so much to adaptation. And this is why we have this initiative it eh, has adaptation as its entry point, but also with co-benefits and mitigation because farmers won't differentiate if they are into mitigation eh, or adaptation. They want an intervention a that will jointly eh, help them to overcome their climate un, risks una de, de que a su with a number of benefits that can help eh, um, then improve their livelihood. So it's important to think about integrating both things, medication and ad adaptation in these more holistic actions. This initiative aims at um, working in the region with 100 microfinance institutions, reach uh, 3 million small farmers and deep block 5 million dollars dispersed in the following years es, es and how are we working here. This is a very interesting de, de, uh, work because it integrates all the sustainable desde finance de, uh, desde la uh, systems desde nosotros, from the eh, academia, como CGI, research, CGI, AR, 
y tener la necesidad is, proveyendo esos datos y esa información científica que ya tenemos y hemos probado lo que funciona o no well, para que se genere un soporte and, uh, en esta toma de decisiones tanto de instituciones microfinancieras como de, de agricultores que les permitan implementar diferentes medidas de adaptación y mitigación eh, que den cuenta que se están adaptando, que se están mitigando y de esta forma ser más atractivos In this way, we para can make uh, it more attractive for investors eh, and they esos, can eh, generate services in donde realmente saben que están contribuyendo financial a, service provision es, acciones, while contributing to eh, adaptation and medication. Crear, eh, so they can de um, create some eh, differentiated seguros, uh, y demás. Um, eh, portfolios, they can esto, have insurance eh, teams, etc. We have been working on this. These are um, the ones that are the ones that start. We have um, uh, the CGRC CAPS and uh, uh, Spanish uh, investment fund that is called Gawa Capital. And some lessons we learned from the strategic alliances for resilience where we have in more than 50 microfinance institutions involved. We have strengthened, um, we have, uh, strengthened capacity in the use of climate information, but also in the use of data for decision making. These strategic alliances with microfinance institutions are important because they have local presence and knowledge. They know about the challenges and opportunities producers have and the mechanisms to materialize efforts with a real impact. They are there with farmers day to day. All this uh, agroclimate information is provided at local scale from science, but also with co-design uh, based on science, taking into account uh, producer resilience in their productive systems, as we have uh, learned about in our different research pieces. Que esté a la vanguardia para que el global market, eh, financiera, el eh, market, eh, to develop financial eh, locales, um, es muy importante instruments um, that are customized eh, to local uh, conditions. When we talk about sustainable microfinance, the local context is very important. What works Perú, for a farmer una, una in Colombia won't work for a farmer in Peru. It's very eh, important to eh, take eh, into account y, the y context. También, eh, poder tener esas, eh, ese conocimiento, esas and also eh, have strategic opportunities tied to knowledge eh, so investment último, can eh, have no a better impact. La Finally, no last but not cuando, least, cuando um, hablando de our metrics when we talk eh, about investment, when we eh, talk about adaptation and mitigation, eh, we un reto muy grande y es have la parte a very de la, big de challenge. O sea, Measurement. Lo que estoy lo que what haciendo, este proyecto, we are doing in this project, este project in this no. investment si no fund, unas is it impacting si or not? Medición, if claro, we don't have metrics and a no, clear no plan for measurement from the start, we won't be able to know how to quantify benefits and co-benefits of adaptation and mitigation y through our strategies. Una and unos also design and validate eh, indicators that should be very clear to measure resilience que final, and improvement of livelihoods eh, eh, when eh, no? working eh, in mitigation eh, and esta, adaptation. Esta de agricultores There's más resilientes a farmers that are more resilient, mobilization y por supuesto, of capital eh, towards sustainable investments, and eh, uh, sustainable agriculture hay, adapted hay, hay, to climate hay, are the three elements here. Um, e igual, I think I have no more time and uh, we will share our uh, slides with you. Yeah, sure, we'll share them. Thank you very much, Andrea. Metrics, what you say is something that has also been emphasized by Ramiro and 
connection to um, measurements in science that offer us some backup and allow us to work with evidence. Thank you very much, Andrea. Can we have a, we can have a clarification question if someone wants to ask it. Miguel, please, you have the floor uh, with a quick question. Thank you, Miguel. Your presentation was very interesting, Andrea. Good morning. Just to broaden the information, can you talk about a specific financial product that is in, in, in which you translate all this information in Peru? The, in Peru, social banking is in charge of these topics, but oftentimes the design of the... Um, Final um, sí, bueno, ya financial en, product en has restrictions financiero, eh, concerning final, the final última, uh, financial eh, product. Ha I have not been involved really, con, con but Japo Solution, que es el entre las there is a bridge eh, between eh, microfinance and us, and eh, I have realized that there are different que, por microfinance ejemplo, institutions that are using an app to evaluate vulnerability to climate change for some products that have um, some guidance concerning um, climate change in terms of adaptation and mitigation. If these farmers comply with those requirements, they can apply to the funds in these microfinance institutions. You can leave me your email in the chat and I can share more information with you. Yes, it's interesting to know um, what the ba entry barriers are in terms of guarantees, um, interest rates, um, terms, uh, return indicators because social banking is very much based on that. And when they go to the end client, those variables are very important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. One more question and we go to the next block, Ramiro. Yes, thank you very much. Very much in the line of Miguel. I'd like Andrea to inform us about the fact of using interest rate uh, uh, terms, uh, was there co-funding guarantees, were there subsidies, uh, was there a combined or blended finance uh, framework? Um, the funding of the value chain can be an absolutely efficient instrument in decarbonizing all the value chain. And it's something we can talk uh, more about later on. On the other hand, there are two kinds of products for this kind of carbon markets. Ones are the insects inside the um, chain and the others, the offsets that are then sold as bonds. And uh, they can, uh, and, and we can talk more about this later on. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your presentation. Excellent, really. Impressive objectives. Bueno, if you gracias, are so eh, kind, please to, um, tell us. Thank you very much for your question. As for eh, terms and rates, eh, de interés, eh, interest rates, lo pudieron ver, estoy mostrando as you could see, we work in the first study eh, with en, en microfinance institutions in the four countries. Besides collecting info from eh, other similar brindando, products brindando, they were se, uh, providing, uh, we had some focus eh, groups with eh, other uh, financial institutions that allowed una, us una to have a snapshot of what was really happening. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. So let's continue with the third block and now we'll go to the pastoral systems. I wanted to introduce my colleague, Steph Han, 
senior scientist of agri-food uh, systems in the NDN initiative. He is going to talk about pest role, uh, systems and soil organic carbon, the case of Vicuñas. Uh, Steph, you have the floor for 15 minutes. We can see your screen, but not in the presentation mode. It's in the presentation mode now. Mm -hmm. Very good, Steph. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to share with you another case. This is the case of the rangelands and pastoral systems. Uh, for this uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, and this is a little bit based on our finding that, uh, especially in the Andean systems, uh, livestock and uh, and smallholder cropping systems are often integrated uh, at different different altitudes. And also, uh, in the in the nineteen eighties, uh, we had a few anthropologists working at SIP. Uh, one one of them being Japanese. He wrote a beautiful paper uh, called in Spanish uh, "Papa Runa Yama." Uh, and it was about the relationship between men, uh, potato, and, and llamas. Uh, and since then, I've always been fascinated by Andean camelids and the, the role that they play. But the, in this picture, you kind of see uh, the current reality uh, in the Andes. Uh, you see uh, uh, alpacas on the foreground. You see the glacier in the background. Uh, and in, the, in the backdrop, you see uh, a uh, land that is uh, has been tilled uh, to cultivate quinoa, and uh, this land uh, three years ago uh, used to be permanent pasture land uh, only occupied by Andean camelids, uh, like David showed uh, in his presentation uh, last week. Uh, because of temperature rises, uh, agriculture is moving upward, and of course we often talk about the expansion of the forest frontier in the Amazon. But we rarely talk about the, uh, the the upland movement of agriculture and the kind of peatland uh, frontier that is happening in this region. So for those of you who are not familiar with camelids, we have uh, uh, two uh, wild camelids. One is the Bicuña, which is the uh, wild relative of the of the alpaca, uh, both in the left right and in the in the top right. Uh, and we have the guanaco, uh, the wild relative of the of the llama, uh, and of course the llama uh, on the right uh, right lower hand. Uh, why are rangelands and pastoral systems uh, important? Well, these these systems uh, they are of, often overlooked uh, in the Andean region. They uh, occur at high altitude, uh, and they also occur. Uh, in, in other areas like Siberia, uh, uh, like at high high latitude regions, and there is huge uh, overlooked uh, soil organic organic carbon stocks in these in these regions. Uh, pastoralists are stewards of livestock genetic diversity, and rangelands uh, with below ground soil car organic carbon. On, on the other hand, uh, they are often some of the over most overlooked uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, they live in very isolated conditions. Uh, they have no connectivity to to market, uh, and they are often not reached by extension systems. Yet they are uh, essential providers of ecosystem services, uh, and it's important uh, that this is now recognized increasingly uh, by the United Nations. 2026 will be the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. Uh, promoted by the government of Mongolia, and uh, uh, 2024 will be the International Year of Camelids, uh, uh, a proposal put forward originally by the government uh, of Bolivia. So, where do these uh, these pastoral systems uh, occur? They they occur at the upper level of the agricultural frontier in the Andean region all the way uh, from Argentina, northern Chile to, 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 to uh, Ecuador. Uh, then in Colombia, the amount of camelids uh, goes, goes down. Uh, they also coincide uh, with uh, an ecosystem that is commonly called Puna. Uh, and the Puna region is basically 4,000 meters above. And 20, uh, like 20 years ago, the the quinoa and the potato would maximum reach uh, 4,000 meters. 
Nowadays, it's common to find them at 4,400, 4,300 meters, and they're kind of pushing upward uh, this agricultural frontier. If, if we look at, uh, at uh, Peru alone, if we would uh, get rid of the area, the Amazonian area of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Iquitos, Loreto, where you have uh, uh, a lot of uh, permanently inundated uh, peat, peatlands, uh, after that, the, large, the largest stock of uh, soil organic carbon is concentrated at the, these permanent uh, pasture lands above 4,000 meters of altitude. So we wanted to look in one research component that we started two years ago in, as a collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, CERFOR, which is the authority for, uh, for the concessions of, of Bicunha, uh, to start looking at what are actually, what is the socioeconomic reality of uh, the communities that are stewards of, uh, of Bicunhas, and uh, how much soil organic carbon uh, is actually stored in these uh, in these systems? So the the bicuña in Peru is spread all the way from the north to the south, depending on the year. Uh, people get concessions or or or, or permissions to 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 uh, uh, to harvest the fiber. Uh, uh, this is tightly controlled because the bicuña used to be. A threatened uh, animal. It was on the on the IUCN red list uh, 20 years ago as a near extinct species, uh, and today uh, we have about uh, 200,000 uh, heads uh, at the national level uh, in Peru. It's one of the of the most valuable uh, export uh, fibers, uh, selling at a price between uh, 450 and 500 US dollars per kilo. Uh, and on an annual basis, uh, CERFOR provides authorization to management uh, uh, occupying an area around 150,000 hectares. Nevertheless, the, the, the area of Puna, uh, where the Vicuña occurs, uh, is more than uh, 22 million hectares at a national level. So in this study, uh, we, 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 we looked at soil organic carbon, but we also looked at many other components. In, to in total, uh, 13 communities. We did a, a household and a livelihood survey uh, with what, over uh, 1,000 households. Uh, and uh, in a subsample from these 13 communities from six regions, we selected six communities uh, in which we uh, took an evenly distributed uh, uh, sampling uh, for, for, the, uh, for the carbon stocks uh, uh, between zero uh, and 30 centimeters uh, of depth. So uh, we selected uh, six communities, but within each of the communities, uh, there is different type of management. So in some of the communities, like you see in the table here, like Pilas, uh, they manage about 800 hectares, uh, but they are uh, in what is called semi-cultiverio. So they are basically an fenced area that is managed by the community. Uh, in other areas, uh, they combine uh, fenced areas together with, uh, with wild rangelands, unfenced rangelands, uh, where they do the same practice. This is called in Quechua Chaku. So during a Chaku, basically the whole community makes a, a big net fence uh, and between communities, they capture uh, the bicunas uh, to harvest uh, the fiber. So in total, we, we took about uh, 300 soil samples uh, between altitudes of 4,000 up to 5,000 meters uh, above sea level. So the sampling methods included uh, preparatory work, participatory mapping, defining where the where the Bicunia's management areas are. Uh, then my colleague Javier was here on the call. He spent months and months in the field together with a with another team uh, uh, walking around uh, these these huge rangelands and uh, uh, taking at different points in space uh, the, the the samples, uh, so we used uh, a polygon uh, and uh, up to thirty centimeters deep and five samples uh, being mixed uh, and then processed and it was analyzed for so soil organic carbon at the uh, Agraria uh, University. 
uh, in Lima. At the same time, we also took samples at three different depths of the of the bulk density, uh, so the dry weight of soil uh, divided basically by the by the, by by the volume. Uh, so uh, let's go a little bit into the into the findings. So, like I I, I was mentioning before, the the this doesn't represent the soil organic carbon stocks uh, for the whole territory. Uh, this uh, Bicunas are, are commons, uh, just like the uh, rangelands where they are managed. Uh, so this is managed at the communal level. And in the end, the, uh, the uh, benefits coming from the sales of the fiber uh, are also in invested in the, in the community. Uh, some communities like the one on the left hand, uh, close to Lima, they have only one area. And uh, the other example on the right, uh, you see five uh, management territories uh, 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 that that are managed in parallel. We sampled each of these uh, of these uh, areas. So we also did a floristic uh, study, uh, like how is the uh, floral composition of each of these different types of uh, soil coverage. So we can simplify this uh, and say we basically have the boffedal. The boffedal is a type of peatland. Uh, that is often partly inundated. Uh, we have the cesspit, which is more herba herbaceous uh, floral composition. And we have the pajonal, which is often straw type and higher types of vegetation uh, dominated by a species called Stipa ichu. Uh, but what we can notice here in the results for the three territories, or for the six territories, uh, apologies, that uh, the amount uh, uh, varies between 137 uh, metric ton uh, per hectare all the way to uh, 233 uh, metric ton uh, per hectare in the case of uh, Bargoi. So it depends on the, on the territory and the soil uh, coverage, but overall these values are uh, very high. Uh, and this is just a confirmation that, uh, that on these uh, pasture lands there is very high level of uh, of soil organic uh, carbon uh, stored uh, in the soil if we look at the different type of types of uh, of coverage of the of uh, that we find at these altitudes uh, with the exception of uh, uncovered soil uh, there is no huge difference between the the permanent peatlands the boffedal uh, the cesspit the puna and the pajonal uh, but this is only true when we talk about the first uh, 30 centimeters. We know from other studies uh, that in the Boffedal, uh, the peatlands, uh, you can measure all the way up to three, four meters of depth. Uh, and there are many studies that measure up to two meters of depth. So there's a high level of accumulation. So the values that we see here, which are much higher than an average uh, cropping system, uh, actually uh, underrepresent the full stock uh, of soil or carbon carbon uh, in these in these highlands uh, we need deeper measurements uh, for 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 those uh, so just to just to give you an idea for these six territories where we did the analysis uh, uh, what level of stocks we are talking about uh, so if you look at the whole territory it goes uh, all the way from from uh, a bit above uh, 100,000 uh, metric tons uh, uh, for one territory in the case of Pilas, which is the smaller one of the smaller territories, and then Pinay, which is a community that is only dedicated to livestock in in Cusco. Uh, we're talking about more than two million uh, metric tons uh, for the whole territory. Uh, of the bicunas, and of course we can also convert that into the amount per head of bicunas managed, uh, and there is quite a bit of uh, variability. Uh, of course, we have to benchmark this, and and how how does this compare to to other systems and other publications? Uh, just to confirm that these uh, amounts, these volumes of carbon are uh, are very high. Uh, in the same type of rangelands that are being plowed for maca or pasture, uh, previous reported values are, are much lower, significantly lower. Uh, if we look at the 
uh, at the Paramo uh, in Colombia, uh, we have uh, in the first uh, 25 centimeters uh, reports of values that are, are similar. Uh, and if we compare it also to the Jalca, which is a type of Paramo in the north uh, of Peru, uh, the values are also similar, but much higher compared to uh, soil organic carbon in uh, montane forest uh, and compared to uh, agroforestry system uh, in the in the Amazon forest, of course, without comparing the above ground uh, carbon. And here again, uh, uh, we just mentioned that the lowest in one community was 137 or 37 metric ton per hectare. Uh, in the highest in another community, Warkoi, 233. Uh, metric tons per hectare and here you can see like a typical uh, community where they already do interventions on carbon insetting in the landscape uh, by having uh, hedges and forests that was published by the by the group of Steve Fanick uh, and uh, Steve Fonte from the Colorado State University that in those cases uh, with an elder forest or a mixed forest, you get maximum values for below ground carbon uh, of slightly lower than 80 metric tons uh, per hectare. Uh, and of course, if you count then also the above ground carbon, then the values get higher, but they never get as high as you get in these pastoral systems. So what I am, uh, and I'm not an expert in this, but what I am very interested in uh, is to have a discussion and to think critically about how can these pastoral marginalized communities at very high altitude uh, benefit from these huge stocks that they are conserving uh, in their land? You know? And uh, how can it be that a, that, a, that a very profitable and high value uh, by, uh, icon of the, of the, of the bioeconomy in, in, in the Andes, the Bicunia, uh, cannot have a, a kind of payment for environmental services back to these custodians above of maintaining the species for also maintaining uh, the carbon. Uh, so, so maybe it can be uh, in a market that looks at offsetting uh, because uh, we could only talk about insetting in the case of pasture land or rangeland restoration. Uh, can we sell stocks that can measurably be prevented from being tilled? So can if soils can measurably not be incorporated into agriculture with, with, uh, with, with rising temperatures, can farmers be financially compensated for this? Uh, and how is it possible to, in, to convince the, uh, the fashion industry uh, to, to have a, a financial scheme uh, that compensates these communities uh, while they uh, work on a kind of uh, carbon neutral uh, uh, strategy. So here I don't have the answers. I just leave it for the, for the discussion. And with many thanks to all the institutions and the CGIR initiatives that are part of this uh, and the team uh, that, that did all the field work uh, uh, at high altitude in Peru. Uh, thank you. Muchas gracias, Esther. Thank you very much, Seth. A very interesting presentation. And it emphasizes our carbon stocks in um, the high Andes. And also remember that NDCs in the country uh, have also a measure uh, on mitigation devoted to restoring and managing high Andean pastoral uh, systems. We only have time for one question, uh, and I pass the floor to Ramiro. Ramiro, you have the floor. Thank you very much, David. Excellent presentation, Seth. Really very, very interesting. I congratulate you also. Your presentation finished with a question, can there be an offset in terms of um, carbon uh, fixation or fixing. Yes, yes, we can do that, definitely. There are two issues to be taken into account. First, how we seriously, scientifically prove that such and such level of carbon has been 
um, sequestered as a consequence of this productive activity. If we can certify this, a bond can be issued, uh, an instrument, um, uh, transactable paper uh, can be issued that can be sold in the market or directly to one of these uh, companies that do um, high fashion with this kind of fiber. Now, carbon neuter is a complicated theme because we can only accredit carbon neuter when the company that buys these inputs, these fibers, also has a decarbonization plan. Even more so, they have a zero carbon promise they definitely need to have their paperwork in order in terms of decrease of uh, greenhouse gases. In scopes one, two, and three, in the uh, greenhouse gas uh, agreement. We can talk about all of this stuff whenever you you want to have a conversation. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I have lots of things to learn there, but I think um, there is a big interest in this sector uh, to be able to issue these bonds. And in our debate with our panelists, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Thank you very much. Excellent. So time's running. And a very quick question, Ian, and then Augusto. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Thank you very much, Steph, for this uh, presentation. There's another fundamental aspect, which is, uh, which has been worked out for several years. Uh, that is uh, peatlands um, um, ecology. They retain water, and that's also fundamental for the entire chain, right? So that's the additional thing. Uh, besides um, um, alpacas and vicuñas uh, raising, so um, people working there manage these peatlands. And it's a win-win too here, because the bigger amount of carbon will also mean a bigger retention of water. And that's fundamental in our current context. I think it's very, it's very interesting what you have uh, studied in terms of the fiber value chain for vicuñas and alpacas. At the same time, I think it's very important to think about the water management aspect. In the end, this water could uh, be um, necessary for a number of activities, and we need to check that balance with the communities. There are some current studies in this regard because it's not necessary. Well, irrigating peatlands is not necessarily the most effective thing to do, but communities there have a lot of experience. They know their territory much better than we do. I just wanted to mention these two lines. They go together and they generate joint benefits. Yes, very good point. And you're highlighting an ecosystemic service that is essential. It's carbon plus water. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Your final comment, Augusto, and we close this block. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Stefan, for the presentation. My, I'm going to leave my comment for Miguel's presentation, Stefan just mentioned that in AgriLed Resilient, Resilient, where we are working with these opportunities for identifying uh, 
climate change mitigation and integrating that with other um, development uh, objectives, we can go in depth uh, into this work and make this feasible, uh, conserving peatlands, carbon in the, the kind of um, um, cattle raising you mentioned. Yes, uh, this is very much related to Agrilet's uh, work. Excellent, Augusto. Thank you, Augusto, because now I have to present our, in our next block. Uh, and it finishes in Colombia. It's an honor for me to introduce Augusto Castro. He's a senior scientist of agri-food systems with low emissions in the uh, climate action uh, unit of Biodiversity Alliance. He has worked for more than 15 years in uh, managing natural resources. He collects funds. It does management and research for developing policies in Peru, Colombia, and the global south. His experience was acquired through interventions in prestigious organizations on sustainable agricultural medication, um, farming research, and policy development. Thank you very much, Augusto, for being here. Uh, he'll be talking about sustainable business models and opportunities in the carbon market. We're going to start with Miguel Romero's uh, talk. And then I finish with mine, which is very brief. Okay, thank you, David. Then I, um, we have another talk in this block in the cacao case for Colombia, and this will give context to Augusto's uh, talk. Miguel Romero is a researcher in multifunctional landscapes and um, in the Alliance of Biodiversity, uh, CGIR. He will talk about carbon stocks and cacao productive systems. Thank you very much, uh, David. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Just let me know if you can see my presentation. We can see your screen. And it's in the, in the full presentation uh, screen. Thank you, David. You just cut me if I go um, too long. Good morning. The idea is to talk about work we have done with cacao in Colombia and Peru. I worked in the multifunctional landscape uh, team and in the climate action team with Augusto, we have some joint works uh, in Peru and Colombia. What we have tried is to identify specific attributes in terms of adaptation and mitigation in cacao crops. Um, um, I'm going to talk more about quantification. A key issue is to monitor, to have data. Data will uh, uh, substantiate our decisions. Um, in these two projects, we see what is the um, scope for this quantification. These are cacao projects in areas uh, that are deforested in Colombia and Peru. Uh, our question is, if there's deforestation, how much carbon do we lose? How much is being emitted to the atmosphere? This is what I wanna share with you. Let's say we have natural carbon stock here in these forests and then we subject them to deforestation, we lose uh, attributes and ecosystemic services, and we start seeing degradation in terms of carbon sequ sequestration. So uh, what are the uh, alternative strategies to um, cure this damage? And what sy systems can uh, sequestrate this carbon we have, uh, at least in part? That's our interrogation and where we move. The first project is led by Augusto, Sustainable Systems for Land Use. 
Um, and this shows the context we are working in and what are the specific conditions according to climate. This is a Caqueta municipality in Colombia, close to the Amazon basin. Deforestation processes are very active there and we need to identify conditions, soil, climate, etc., and the dynamics of soil uh, use in the region. And also the communities there, how they are socioeconomically made up. And we do a number of surveys to identify how these communities are in socioeconomic terms and how we relate that to uh, mitigation potentials if they receive technological aid. So uh, we have a census of all the cacao producers there and we characterize them. And when we talk about carbon sequestration, we have to put this into landscape as compared to the productive system where they are located. This is the Caqueta department. This is a satellite image of natural forests and small polygons where you see cacao farms in Colombia, particularly in that department. And you start to identify the relationship between uh, cacao in degraded areas if they are being implemented there, in that case is restoration, or if they are in areas uh, of native forests, another case in, in Caqueta. So we draw the panorama and identify different systems. In some regions, we find monoculture, it's only cacao. Uh, we can also find agro uh, forest conventional low yield with low use of chemical inputs in very positive scenarios where agroforestry is organic. We always monitor the forest as reference and in Caqueta, where there is an active deforestation system, we uh, find these systems where producers intervene their natural forest they do selective uh, pruning, it leaves some higher species and they um, cultivate, uh, they only, um, they only um, fell lower species and put cacao instead. So we see soil, climate, pay, uh, landscape, um, producers, communities, management systems, and then formulate strategies or practices that can work. Here, an important point, if we know the nature of producers and if we want to formulate strategies to reduce emissions and increase carbon sequestration, we need the whole chain producers and other market agents, they all move the strategy together. An example, if there are organic systems, we need to have other system components um, with organic um, matters. As Andrea said, if we want to work with pastoral systems, we need to know about the inputs needed. So we need to involve all players and of course the market. We classify possible practices. We have our baseline. We say what are the possible strategies. We check the literature and we see in, well, cacao is in agroforestry, the one that is best for sequestering carbon and we combine that with um, other kinds of smaller crops, we can uh, even uh, leverage uh, carbon sequestration. Now, the key question is which goes for what kind of producer? 
So we co-design with them. Together with them, we identify their capacities and attributes. De mitigación que se esté subiendo o no. And Eso. if um, they can assume the mitigation practice we are suggesting. And we have to do that on a one to one basis. When we co design with those producers, it's important to include. producers. We improve their production system. Cacao is converted into organic. Uh, we help them to go from monoculture to forest cacao. But what we want is to make some sort of ecologic uh, transaction. They commit to conserve specific areas in their property or to restore some other areas. We have like symbolic agreements concerning conservation. If we think into the future, if we have carbon stock in those properties, that should be recognized. This is the kind of system that we identify with mitigation potential. With cacao, it's renewing crops, better agronomic uh, cult, um, practices, uh, improve prunes, improve yields, use the least uh, resources or inputs possible. We go from synthetic fertilization to organic fertilization. We deal with post-harvest issues towards benefits, also risks. We manage uh, risk um, reservoirs and restoration. <clears throat> These are pilots. We have tested them in the field. We have conventional producers and we uh, collect data. Scientifically working. Uh, we cannot talk about selling carbon bonds if we don't know how much the system is uh, producing. If I have 100 tons of carbon in a property, it's important to know that if I have carbon emissions, I can discount. If I have 100 tons and I'm uh, emitting 20 tons, I have 80 tons to uh, get an offset mechanism. And it's important to quantify how much we emit. Two months ago, we finished this project for quantifying um, emissions due to the use of uh, synthetic or organic fertilizers in invasive systems. And we characterize the different kinds of management and their emissions. And secondly, very important for cacao, we have characterized uh, reduction of emissions. We can see how much these systems are sequestering. We sequestering. We do monitoring forest inventories in the field with those conventional monoculture agroforest, invasive agroforest um, systems, and we identify carbon sequestration in all of them. Eight years, I'm sorry, eight days ago, we finished our last uh, carbon monitoring. We are collecting uh, data. There is very interesting data that shows specific attributes for different cacao uh, cropping systems. In Colombia, we have producers that are well characterized by their emissions, their potential for reduction and their capacity for sequestration. Uh, I will share that information as soon as we can. There is another project with a similar approach, but where we don't have data collection. However, we have very valid estimations. Uh, some here have perhaps seen some of these graphs. This was a similar exercise in Peru, in Pucallpa. There we evaluated different typologies, a similar scenario. 
traditional producers, low yield, low use of inputs, um, and um, how much CO2 equivalent uh, per kilogram of uh, cacao in organic, uh, that goes, well, that is 0 0.19, and then organic 0 0.87, and then uh, technified uh, to 4.45 of uh, kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of carbon. That's the baseline in these producers, and we're evaluating their typologies in terms of deforestation too. And uh, if those systems are implemented in areas that uh, were forests, emissions per kilogram can increase a lot. A traditional will not emit 0 0.19, but 40 kilos per kilogram because they are deforesting. So these are the two diagnoses made, diagnostics made. The best uh, scenario when there is no change of the soil use and the worst change where there is change of soil use. And here we find the best practices or strategies. We do ex ante analyses um, and we um, have what if uh, scenarios. Uh, these have allowed us to identify these same producers with low, mid of, or high intensity uh, input use. And we play with a number of scenarios in terms of what if, if we use mulch or compost or um, vegetables or um, bird droppings uh, or et cetera, et cetera, and combinations of these and what is more useful for them. And we have a number of uh, what if scenarios under those uh, scenarios are, uh, of what if we have a reforestation business model. I will still will um, talk about what happens uh, with this in Colombia. And uh, we test that with groups of producers. We do our business uh, model. They implement practices in agroforest arrangements committing to zero deforestation. And I can share those documents uh, through David. They have just been published. This is an example of a business model in cacao. We have this baseline um, producers. Uh, they used to issue like 3.2, uh, 300, 300 uh, uh, to 20 uh, tons per year, and most uh, were because of deforestation. So we have these defer zero deforestation agreements. We improve um, density of their plantation, and we lower from these uh, 3,200 tons to 700 tons. Additionally, uh, due to implementing agroforest arrangements, we can even remove up to 1,100 tons for that specific group of producers. And um, this group is part of an association and the association can sell these attributes in their uh, business model. They reduce emissions and increase sequestration. The key point, the, it's a key, the key point there. And another thing, and this was a model we did with um, Excel estimations taking some data, but then we started visiting producers who have implemented these strategies. We adjusted our information and with these pilot uh, producers, we saw a significant um, potential for carbon reduction and increase of sequestration. So the next step was to organize an, uh, a monitoring, reporting, and verification system with uh, good practices of data management with clear criteria on how to monitor emissions and sequestration, how they should be reported, and who should verify those emissions and sequestration to see if the system is 
uh, reliable, and if not, I am doing data makeup. We did this for palm and for cacao in Peru, and we want to do the same thing in Colombia. This uh, monitoring report and verification of emissions system allow us to have this kind of graphs. This is the baseline. If the system would have continued with deforestation, emissions would be ever higher along the years. But when we do this um, business agreements, we can stabilize um, emissions because we sequ sequester carbon and reduce emissions and the association can sell um, um, these as bonds to five, 15 or 20 years uh, when they sell cacao and uh, well produce and sell cacao and andrea as andrea said what we want is to generate generate um, science-based information that will allow cacao to have its attributes in terms of um, carbon reduction and sequestration um, with data on the table and what players can be interested with these um, data and what we can do with that in the future. Uh, perhaps we go to Augusto. Yes, let's go to Augusto. Birkett, Augusto, you have the floor. Hello, thank you very much. I'm looking for the presentation. I hope it is this one. Can you show my presentation? It's telling me that Zoom needs updating or something like that. It's complicated. I sent it to Vivi. Okay, we're going to take a look at it. Well, let's start talking. My presentation is very short. It's only one slide. What Miguel just showed us and what Stefan also showed are very similar things, basically quantifying carbon, the MRV, measuring, reporting, and verification. What is that used for? We think that our sustainable practices can help us reach carbon markets. And why do we want to reach those carbon markets? Because we have the hope that we can scale up sustainable practices and will have an impact in reducing deforestation emissions, loss of peatlands, um, sustainable, increasing sustainable systems, etc. Just one slide. So what we understand is that although the carbon market is a business model. There are other business models. What we finally want to do is to make these productive systems profitable together with mitigating climate change. So we are proposing six steps that are um, indispensable to scale up these systems, to design these systems and scale them up so that more people adopt these sustainable practices. Stefan and Miguel have started by the last step, measuring climate change and measuring um, greenhouse uh, gases, and also the co-benefits of these actions. Water was mentioned when Stefan um, presented, and that's very appropriate, but there are other co-benefits depending on how we see them. If we implement uh, climate action measures, we can adapt, we can conserve, we can reduce poverty, etc. We can start by conserving water and have uh, mitigation as a co-benefit, etc. Our first step is to prioritize regions and geographies and technologies to work on the transition to low emissions food systems. We hope that potential 
will overlap geographically with other development priorities like water, as was mentioned in Seth's uh, case. Why is that important? Because we understand that in our countries, priority is not necessarily mitigating climate change. We understand that developing countries have contributed very little with the greenhouse gases and they have committed to mitigation, but they are more predisposed to uh, implementing adaptation or other development activities. So we identify these overlaps, these places where there is uh, um, an overlap um, of mitigation and adaptation as possibilities. So um, different uh, actors can become committed with these sustainable actions. Uh, the next step is very important, assessing the um, governance models and institutional drivers of food system emissions. Why we are changing historical cattle raising systems, why uh, farmers um, fell lower trees and put cacao instead, as Miguel mentioned, understanding that is essential to propose a strategy that will lead us to scaling up these sustainable systems. A third step is assessing the potential of adoption of technology and institutional innovations to reduce food system emissions. We say that farmers do not or would adopt with a financial incentive and that farmers are guided by their financial interests. That is an assumption that is very much extended, but it's very much debated too. It's a red plus mechanism where they said that by incentivizing farmers and paying the them for their opportunity cost, they would stop uh, deforestation and um, <clears throat> forest degradation, but apparently that's not true. On the other hand, the opportunity cost is very high and it cannot be offset by carbon markets. The good news is that farmers won't necessarily adopt something sustainable due to financial interests. This does not mean that Farmers do not need financial aids to adopt, but that's not necessarily the driver. <laughs> the CGIAR, SIP, and many other research centers for many years have implemented ex post impact uh, analyses to understand adoption uh, factors. And in Colombia, we use these ex post analyses to see why farming would adopt them and why they wouldn't. Um, we can talk about more farmers adopting these sustainable practices. Uh, also, we need to understand the value chain, all the factors in it and the barriers along it to adopt. That's very important to uh, propose a strategy that would identify, and this is step four, that barriers for adoption are not financial, but technical aid, for example. A scaling up strategy would need to emphasize providing necessary technical aid so uh, farmers adopt these technologies. Finally, designing business models uh, to reach the profitability we're looking for is very important. There can be several financing funds like um, carbon markets. Um, in many opportunities, um, they were intervened by NGOs before and by previous um, funding services, which have facilitated the business model and this can be part of the so-called blended finance. However, although carbon um, funding is interesting for farmers, uh, the most important for farmers is a productive part. And that's why 
in Peru and Colombia, there are several mechanisms, policy instruments, financial and economic instruments that help um, make these sustainable business models profitable, combined with other funding services that can increase profitability and fav favor adoption. I don't know if Carlos is here, but he can, and if we have time, he can tell us a little bit how we are seeking to assemble cacao business models in Colombia using not only carbon uh, market models, but also instruments such as um, work for taxes. Yes, I'm no, pues here. Trabajando en yes. De como obras yes. Por we're working in them and also a payment bueno, for environmental Augusto, digamos, services and credit no instruments. As I was just said, a single instrument cannot guarantee uh, adoption of red plus models. Basically, we're identifying what these models, these financing models are through credits. Colombia has several funding uh, models and also uh, payments for environmental services and financial mechanisms is works for taxes. Big taxpayers do not pay taxes, they can um, do that through uh, projects for adaptation to climate change or sustainable production systems. Another way of funding uh, climate offsets, and uh, we also have mandatory offsets where companies that do different kinds of activities need to compensate for the activities they do, so these companies can do so through uh, mechanisms, well, sustainable in Colombia mechanisms or Digamos, uh, diferentes instrumentos y también se cuentan con projects. mecanismos and de no causación del impuesto de carbono. Existe hoy el impuesto nacional al carbono. There's a national tax to carbon eh, in se cobra, Colombia pues, now. Por, eh, uh, so so it's collected for CO2 uh, equivalent uh, in fossil fuels, carbon tax, gasoline, kerosene, the uses in companies can pay this tax, which is for cada una de las toneladas, o digamos en su defecto hacer un mecanismo de compensación a través de mecanismos de neutralidad. Uh, uh, offset uh, through uh, carbon neutrality de, mechanisms, and that is a, a development of a local voluntary market, and there, there are transactions in this, and there Entonces, have been developments and difficulties to Perhaps later on we can tell you a little bit uh, about the barriers we have found for adopting and implementing these uh, models. Um, eh, pues básicamente es around que the carbon, eh, uh, todo son de carbon taxation. And these are genera, digamos, small producers, producer projects. Se estaba, digamos, so todos los there are high transaction costs, and we are working on systems that estimate uh, emission factors, as it was uh, presented by Miguel. But we are working from international policy. In terms of projects, we are strengthening standards in estimations so that the standards are more uh, reliable. And uh, we are also doing um, economic pre-feasibility analyses. Not, they are not necessarily uh, profitable now because of high transaction costs. They are small properties, um, about 10 hectares, and this generates high transaction costs, particularly for monitoring, um, reporting, monitoring, and verification mechanisms. We have some pilots. Um, where we don't have uh, bigger profits than uh, 30,000 pesos per hectare. And this shows uh, what we need to make these mechanisms uh, more feasible. I'm sorry, Augusto, I, I got into your uh, own presentation. Yes, uh, all that is level five uh, business models. And finally, step six that uh, were mentioned by Stefan and Miguel measuring not only carbon um, benefits, but also co-benefits like water, biodiversity, etc. And something very important to measure 
always, no matter how good intentions we might have, we can have undesirable effects and we have to prevent that. So we are sure that we are not harming instead of um, benefiting. Thank you, Carlos. My presentation is ended. Muchas gracias. Excelentes presentaciones. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations today. We're a bit delayed with our agenda. I know there are questions, but now we go to our debate because of our agenda. We have comments from two panelists, Colombia and Peru. Erika Serrano is Senior Associate of Natural Resources in the um, Environment and uh, Sustainability Network. Uh, uh, Erika, please, your comments uh, about uh, these talks. Well, thank you very much, David, for this invitation. It's been, it's been very interesting to listen from the research sector, all the contributions you have around crops, particularly cacao in Colombia. <clears throat> I'm surprised about the fact that these high level debates in farming <clears throat> are not so much related to sustainability or exploiting carbon markets. And this is very incipient in other forums. Uh, because of what Augusto, Carlos, and others have said, uh, this debate is very high level, and I'm very pleased to see that. Now, from the legal perspective, you're expert in terms of methodologies and technical aspects, but from legal aspects in Colombia, there's a voluntary market of um, carbon bonds, and more and more industries participate by emitting, I'm sorry, issuing bonds to be transacted domestically and internationally as a compensation for carbon taxation. Some companies uh, have to pay this carbon taxation tax to offset their CO2 emissions because they um, buy and burn fossil fuels. And there are a number of formulas that determine how much uh, CO2 they emit by buying and burning these uh, fuels. And the carbon market in Colombia was established in 2016. And it offsets uh, that um, CO2 emission by supporting funding to projects that mitigate or compensate CO2 emissions. The bad news for those involved in these markets with the new um, tax reform, we have, we have been hit uh, because formerly, as Miguel and Carlos said, we had the possibility of offsetting 100% of CO2 emissions derived from those uh, fossil fuel uh, purchases in Colombia. And now it's only 50%. So it's a direct hit to the possibility of transacting these bonds that were motivated uh, by the need of compensating uh, carbon tax. It can um, be only 50% now. And this was a strategy that does not show effects right now, but we will see them next year. We will see that demand for carbon bonds will not be very high and perhaps um, the price will decrease. This is what we see in the short term um, with this carbon taxation uh, that used to be a dynamizing factor, but this is in standby. What is true is that because of the Colombian agreement has a number of commitments with the Paris Agreement and taking into account that Colombia has a very ambitious um, objective of reducing 
uh, GHEs, 51 percent uh, to 2030 as compared to the baseline, a very ambitious uh, goal. So there is a law in Colombia since um, 2017, the climate change law that establishes the national program of um, transactable uh, emissions. This is a regulated market for emissions in Colombia. It's part of the legal architecture of this uh, these programs. And this instrument that works like uh, um, compensation to emissions will leverage much more the carbon bond market in the future. The first transaction of this kind will be perhaps in five or six years, but it will start regulating in more detail uh, both supply and demand for carbon bonds. What will probably happen with its regulation uh, is that each industry will have a maximum um, amount um, authorized and they'll have to go to the market bond to try to offset their extra emissions, the ones that, are ex that exceed their authorized uh, um, cap. So the regulation is still incipient, as I said, there is only uh, the legal consecration of this system that was in 2017. The World Bank and the um, Colombian government are studying this carbon trade system. They need to do some pilot projects, etc. But what we see is that we'll have a market bond that will be mandatory and regulated that will leverage all that you said in this forum. This is where I finish from the legal point of view. Congratulations for this initiative. I'm gladly surprised. Thank you very much, Erika. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your words, which have very much enriched our debate. <laughs> we also have Albert Kibon from the World University Service in Canada. He is a panelist and will receive. Gracias, David. Andre. Eh, buenos días a Thank todos you, y todas. David. Good morning to eh, you. All. Yo voy a mi palabras cortas. To en dos Focus preguntas que my, uh, Steph me ha hecho cuando me invitó a participar en este evento. Eh, Steph me preguntó uh, event, Steph eh, de abordar lo de la asociatividad or, yeah, como una necesidad para que los pequeños about, productores, en este caso uh, estoy hablando de eh, los, los alpaqueros y vicuñeros en estos ámbitos donde Steph nos mostró estos datos impresionantes. Uh, with de stock de carbono y lo otro es cómo podríamos uh, aprovechar eh, estas, and, uh, estas habilidades well, de los uh, pastores y pequeños productores para gestionar mejor esos stock de carbono. Desde lo primero que quisiera recordar, me voy a enfocar a la realidad de Perú. Eh, yo soy en varias Peru. actividades eh, asesor de una cooperativa de alpaqueros I desde hace 10 años, Pecan, Perú. Producer, eh, Pecan, y lo que debemos Peru. tener muy presente en todos nuestros trabajos, And, uh, eh, por más científico, eh, técnico, científico, no, no social que seamos, social, es que en el agro uh, lo que predomina or, es la informalidad. Um, technical, um, Entonces, eso condiciona mucho de las estrategias que podemos desarrollar. En el caso particularmente de los camelidos, una, una camelids, hablo de alpaca y vicuña que conozco por experiencia. Vicuña, eh, el gran tema que tenemos ahí es que frente a esa informalidad hay un oligopolio. Hay dos empresas en el Perú que son las que tienen uh, más del 90% del mercado de exportación de fibras. Eh, y una particularmente en Vicuña, todos deben conocer, eh, de a uh, Louis Vuitton, And que es el líder mundial de productos de lujo. The world Ese es un tipo de cadenas of, um, en lo cual trabajamos. Luxury, uh, ¿Cómo podemos realmente eh, fomentar, so apoyarnos en las capacidades with. de gestión How de los pequeños we, productores um, 
be supported on their en este caso, uh, on small, ganaderos, uh, ¿no? farmers or small uh, cattle el, 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 raised, creo que la única respuesta uh, posible uh, es, uh, es cooperativas. Y I think the only possible Perú, response is cooperatives. Again, through the experience with cooperatives, no ha sido muy favorable, cooperatives has not been very construir cooperativas que llamamos de segunda generación, que son tienen una gestión empresarial con una fuerte gobernanza interna uh, eh, a la par de una gestión internal, um, del negocio día a día. Eso se construye day -day, eh, y para eso uh, hemos trabajado bastante fuerte en uh, capacitar yeah, a los, uh, a los strong, directivos work, ¿no? con, uh, con programas o presidente, training, capacitación uh, modular, no voy a entrar en detalle, pero que tiene la gran ventaja de que hoy en la directiva de la cooperativa hay gente que entiende de negocios, that, cosa que um, ha sido un reto muy grande, pero una inversión que hoy día reintúa. Eh, Copecán um, es el tercer exportador de alpaca de Perú, de lana de alpaca. Tiene 4 o 5% del mercado nada más, pero es un gran avance. Eh, no diría que es un modelo a seguir porque hay muchas cosas que se mejorar, pero funciona en el sentido que logró un crédito eh, el año pasado, bueno, hace tres años, eh, antes de la pandemia, con el BIDLAP. Eh, yo escuchaba con mucho interés que eh, decía la, IDB, la colega, eh, discúlpame que IDB no grabé tu nombre, pero que fue Andrea eh, I de Colombia. Yo escuchaba con mucho interés Andrea, tu, Colombia, tu abordaje del tema financiero. Heard, um, eh, y ahí sí yo quiero dejar una lección aprendida, al menos para Perú. To, uh, el problema que tenemos con el sector financiero es que es esta estructura para los intereses de la fuente de fondeo, es decir, de quién presta el dinero. Pero no se mira suficientemente las condiciones de, de quien recibe el préstamo y después lo tiene que devolver en sus condiciones. Y las condiciones de PUNA son particularmente difíciles. Entonces creo que ahí hay un tema grande. Y es por eso que hay tan pocos productos financieros que estén apropiados a las condiciones de los pequeños productores. Y en Copecán, la experiencia fue muy interesante, products, que para conseguir uh, ese, Copepa, ese Copecam, préstamo del BID, uh, el BID Lab, que va de la mano con una pequeña donación the, para uh, asesoría IGB técnica, lab, uh, nos sentamos uh, um, credit, con el gerente de la cooperativa, con los socios, alpaqueros, en una mesa so frente a frente, una hoja Excel, y construimos con ellos el flujo de caja, primero del pequeño el socio alpaquero de la cooperativa, sheet. First of all, eh, y luego de la cooperativa misma, para que pueda mostrar ante la fuente de financiamiento de este caso de PIB, so que efectivamente era rentable invertir en the, um, eh, siembra y cosecha de agua, that, um, eh, pasto cultivado, forigo para aspersión. Ahora inclusive lo estamos water, haciendo en invernaderos. Pasture, eh, y no, were, probablemente um, no van a alcanzar a ver, pero voy a mostrarles aquí una cartilla, uh, un poquito a lo lejos, uh, all, uh, y van a ver algunas fotos donde And, um, eh, you en varios casos unos socios, socias de la cooperativa están al costado de su invernadero a 4.300 o 4.500 metros y se logra producir en 500 metros cuadrados dos invernaderos de 250 metros cada uno, la misma cantidad de pasto que en una hectárea a cielo abierto, todo bajo río para expresión uh, uh, eh, Eso nos dijeron algunas personas, siempre hay los críticos, uh, they, no, no, no va a funcionar, no, lo que están haciendo ustedes es una barbaridad. Bueno, primero funciona, eh, obviamente se necesita investigación de acompañamiento para trabajar el tema de fertilidad del suelo, el uso eficiente del agua. Pero lo que yo quiero rescatar acá es que arriba de 4.000 metros, si no se hace un uso eficiente del agua y de la energía, no va a pasar nada. Y esas, esos socios, esos alpaqueros, no van a cuidar el recurso, ni el agua, ni el carbono, ni nada, si es que se mueren de hambre. Entonces debemos asegurar un corto retente, un plazo retente corto, de que tengan un ingreso neto anual y decente. Y con esas innovaciones lo hemos logrado. Hay productores, cuando conocí hace 10 años, tenían... Bueno, para los que viven en el Perú, les sonará este, um, 1.500 a 2.000 soles eh, al año, ingreso neto, ago, estamos hablando de 600 dólares, 700 dólares, y ahora lo han multiplicado por 10, 
en 5 a 7 años. Nos dijeron, no, eso es imposible. No, sí es posible. Y, eh, quiero enfatizar que no es solo tecnología, es necesaria, también es organización. También innovación es de organización, innovaciones tecnológicas, combinadas. Con una fuerte inversión en la gobernanza interna y en poco a poco eh, desarrollar las competencias de gestión de la entonces, yo creo que ahí hay una interesante y para volver al tema del stock de carbono bueno yo no sé mucho de carbono aprendo con ustedes pero lo interesante del modelo de Copecán es que al intensificar en área muy pequeña la producción de pastos con buena siembra de cosecha de agua invernaderos las, los alpaqueros dejan de degradar las, 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 las praderas naturales, porque ya no necesitan llevar tres días por aquí, dos días por acá, y muchas veces son mujeres con el niño al hombro, imagínense la calidad de vida que tienen, que hacen esto, degradando los pocos pastos naturales que quedan. Al intensificar una área muy pequeña, se libera esas áreas muy grandes, se recupera una parte de la pradera y muy interesante, hay un regreso de vicuñas. Y eso lo hemos visto en Copecán, que son vicuñeros, principalmente y vicuñeros también. En algunas zonas hemos visto regresar las vicuñas a comerse las praderas que las alpacas ya no, ya no están degradadas. Hay una dinámica que se ha desarrollado gracias a la, a la introducción de innovación en la parte de Ahora, no es fácil replicar eso, tampoco es fácil porque por los oligopolios, eh, lo que ha hecho Copecán es una integración vertical, ¿no? que son exportadores directos. Multiplicar eso no es tan sencillo. Los grandes exportadores, que son dos, dos grandes empresas en el Perú, no lo van a dejar hacer así de fácil porque ellos viven so obviamente eh, de conseguir la de alpaca materia prima a un precio relativamente barato suben y bajan el mercado prices. son capaces de romper este, la competencia they si es que no les conviene entonces, esa es la realidad de los like negocios them, et cetera, et cetera. Eh, entonces tenemos que pensar muy bien esas, so esas estrategias si se quiere eh, ampliar ¿no? que apoyar los pequeños productores que son en Perú especialmente dice 82 mil en, en alpaca en vicuña es difícil calcular porque es en uh, alpaca es un bien es común o sea, no, no hay un resultado individual si no igual es un buen número de comuneros que se benefician de la cadena de valor de la alpaca de la vicuña pero cómo aumentamos cómo logramos que el valor final so, tanto en alpaca como en vicuña how can eh, the final la proporción del valor final aumente para las comunidades ¿no? actualmente en vicuña increase eh, for de todo lo que se vende a nivel mundial en vicuña, el 4% regresa a las comunidades At world y level, only en alpaca es entre 8 a 10%. To Todo el resto alpaca, se queda en la cadena. It is between 8 to 10%. Entonces, All the rest podemos vender bonos de carbono in the, in the o chain. pensar que, se, que las comunidades pueden negociar bonos de carbono. Bonds or think, eh, uh, about the fact that yo no diría que pago por ver, pero bonds. no va a ser tan fácil armarlo. Pay per view, pasa de todas maneras por una certificación. Felizmente, eh, en el caso de Copecán, ya Copecán tiene una, una certificación RAS, ¿no? es un RAS, RAS es este, eh, Responsible uh, Alpaca Standard, es ese, ese pequeño logo, por si acaso ustedes uh, lo, lo vean ahí en algún momento del mercado, Perhaps pero es una certificación eh, o sea, de buen manejo social, o sea, no hay trabajo de niños, ambiental, porque no child, uh, eh, se, se trata de reducir labor, las emisiones, pero no es que haya una medición exacta de la cantidad de, 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 de emisiones de carbono o de carbono captado. No se explicó muy bien en el caso del tratado. Esos protocolos for, habría que implementarlos um, en el caso sequester. de esa cadena. Uh, eh, veo que este ha empezado muy bien con el suelo. <risa> eh, falta ahí mucho por hacer. Well eh, pero se puede llegar a, a aprender 
a lograr vender eh, bonos de carbono como se hace. Yes, well, Lo que se podría pensar es igual como hay los mereces, ¿no? ese mecanismo de retribución por servicios que existen con en agua. Is this, uh, eh, ahí sí hay experiencia of, en el Perú con el, uh, el programa de, de seguridad hídrica, for, uh, esa infraestructura uh, natural para seguridad hídrica que lo, lo financia Peru, Canadá con el AID. Uh, uh, Podríamos pensar un mecanismo similar para carbono, Canada, pero requeriría una certificación. Uh, USA, ¿no? Y eso sí no uh, tenemos el... el We can think about carbon, but it would require certification, um, and we don't have that protocol. Yo, yo quiero dejarlo acá que ya me, me, me expandí, I have to pero lo que here. sí quiero decir es que si I pensamos en captar fuentes de financiamiento importantes, eh, to, hay que pensar en diseñar los productos financieros más en función uh, de los intereses y no solamente en función de la estructura de la fuente de fondeo. Eso me parece que en el Perú es algo de pero cuando hemos salido todavía. Y por eso que no hay productos financieros adecuados y por eso que en el caso de Copecán todo el financiamiento viene fuera. Nada de que no lo hemos logrado. Esa es la verdad. Gracias. If you wish. Thank you, Alberic. Um, now, this is a final moderation. Okay, we'll take advantage of these 10 minutes again. Uh, congratulations for your participation. It's an avalanche of information from different perspectives from the business model, funding, carbon stocks, certification, uh, metrics. We have learned a lot. So let's take advantage of these 10 minutes to for questions and contributions of uh, colleagues. Your hand is raised. Yes, Ramiro. Ramiro, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Very quickly, because there's very little time. And it's an incredible debate two issues. I don't know if you know Vera, V-E-R-R-A, Vera. This is an institution that fixes standards for uh, carbon uh, bond emission. I'm sorry, issuance. We work with them. And the methodology to determine this is um, slash 0042 agricultural land management, ALM. It establishes a procedure for quantifying uh, carbon reduction and increase of uh, sequestration. I can gladly send this to you. So it circulates in this forum, definitely. In my last slide, you will see the procedures to be followed step by step to reach uh, emission, I'm sorry, issuance and sale of carbon bonds. It's a bit complicated, but this is critical when we want to, well, RMV is critical when we want to define the feasibility of a carbon uh, program. Co-benefits increase the value of these uh, bonds. Co-benefits are essentially what you mentioned, managing water, reducing poverty, protecting biodiversity, increasing gender opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are a number of co-benefits in line with SDGs. This is fundamental. It increases bond values. That's what I wanted to say. So I'm going to send the methodology I was mentioning. And it can guide your efforts. Yes, thank you very much. Do share that. And we'll include it in our uh, writing exercise. 
and in the white paper. Thank you very much, Ramiro, for this info. Miguel, go ahead. A couple of questions here, both for Cacao and for uh, what Elberic said. I don't know if there's time for answers, but at least uh, I formulate the question. Uh, in the cacao experience, you have mentioned that um, um, you have made measurements, uh, but it's not uh, related uh, yet to um, carbon uh, emissions um, market. How do you conceive the uh, final segment in this market for this kind of products that we have to develop in terms of a differential factor? Uh, that is connected to um, carbon emission and sequestration. How do you conceive this? Do you have concrete designs of uh, products and market segments? And in the particular case of cacao, I don't know what happens in Colombia, but uh, I don't know if you consider that um, a variable in that sector is coca. Coca also complicates all this that we are talking now. In a recent evaluation we made for US aid um, for the three uh, alliances, um, the Cacao Alliance, coca is very much related to emission. And it's difficult to manage deforestation connected to coca, for example. Do you have any studies on that variable? Thank you, Miguel. I don't know if uh, Alberic uh, sí. Dale, would like yeah. to say something. Puedo, a ver, ¿quién empieza? Uh, yeah. <laughs> ¿Quién empieza primero? Ya, yeah. bueno, Go gracias. Ahead. Sí, muy, muy, muy brevemente. Ya, yeah. muy brevemente para responder la, la pregunta de Miguel. Mira, lo de la certificación RAS empezó no por un tema ambiental, per se, sino por un tema de maltrato animal. ¿no? Hace unos años uh, se firmaron en un fondo, no daré el nombre animal, aquí en el Perú, pero grande, uh, de maltrato abuse. animales a la hora de la esquila. Uh, y entonces los compradores en los were, mercados internacionales, um, los compradores de la lana de alpaca, empezaron um, a decir que eh, si hay animales harvested, maltratados, yo no compro la fibra y cierro el mercado. Were, Uh, Pan y cuaca, lamentablemente del lado del, del so gobierno del sector público no hubo mucho apoyo para contrarrestar esto. Uh, y es el mismo sector, sector involucrando a Copican que tuvo que reaccionar y buscar un sistema de certificación. Se desarrolló el protocolo por casualidades no entran en detalle. Copican hizo el piloto de la certificación y ahora es el que se está aplicando. ¿no? Y se certifica control unión, control unión. Eh, inclusive eh, Copecan, gracias al, al préstamo del BID, pudo desarrollar en parte de la certificación con blockchain. Se quiere decir que cualquier consumidor, comprador de un producto derivado de, de alpaca, puede verificar de dónde viene la fibra y el manejo que se ha dado. No hay trabajo infantil, no hay maltrato animal. Lo que no hay es el tema de reducción o emisión de carbono. Eso no está incluido en la certificación. Se podría, pero sí conocemos a Berra por otros temas. Y, uh, pero no tiene todavía that, el protocolo uh, what, desarrollado what para, para la PUNA. Ya haremos averiguado, pero bueno, lo, lo uh, podrán areas. Ojalá. Perhaps you can include it, yes. Yes, in fact, you're right. Very well. En Colombia, cacao no es, realmente no es un driver de deforestación. Eh... Y, por, y, y ha sido priorizado en el país en diferentes regiones, digamos, para quitar presión a los bosques. Eh, hay unos casos muy particulares, pero son muy pequeños y muy específicos, donde, digamos, los productores eh, hacen una intervención, deforestan bosque, eh, ponen cacao, pero también en algunos casos se pueden ver algunos cultivos asociados de coca, pero son casos relativamente pequeños. Eh, y ahora, 
en el tema de las certificaciones y cómo se dimensionan en los modelos de negocio es, claro, el modelo de negocio, digamos, la certificación que te puede garantizar que estás cumpliendo algo ya disponible en el mercado es una certificación orgánica, ¿no? Eh, certificación orgánica puedes asumir que sí hay disminución de emisiones por el uso de fertilizantes orgánicos, pero si eres un productor de base que no aplica nada y pasas orgánico, vas a incrementar las emisiones, pero si es un productor tecnificado que baja a orgánico, vas a disminuir las emisiones, entonces hay que ver qué tipología, sobre qué productor yo estoy generando la estrategia, pero digamos que podamos tener, les voy a poner un ejemplo, podemos tener una comunidad de 50 productores de cacao, todos certificados y están bajando 100 toneladas de carbono por migrar de sintético orgánico, pero si hay uno solo de los productores que incurren un proceso de deforestación, todas esas capturas, reducción de emisiones, se van, digamos, eh, a la nada solo por el hecho de haber deforestado, entonces rompiste el balance completamente y no es garantía de, de, de uno de lo otro. ¿Qué es lo que se está haciendo en Colombia? Hay unos acuerdos nacionales que se llaman los acuerdos cero deforestación. La futuro se busca un sello y es donde eh, básicamente diferentes actores del mercado y productores, comercializadores, distribuidores están firmando unos compromisos puntuales para empezar a trazar el cacao que viene de ciertas regiones particulares en Colombia y garantizar que es cero deforestación. Entonces se están implementando y construyendo los protocolos MRB para verificar exactamente que sí es cero deforestación. Entonces ya en el contexto de un modelo de negocio lo que haría es el comprador, por ejemplo, eh, se pega a esos sistemas de monitoreo, reporte y verificación y empieza a verificar que el sistema efectivamente está libre de deforestación y al menos por ahí se está garantizando que esas emisiones no tienen gran impacto. Es más, es más o menos lo que hay ahora disponible en, te, en temas de, 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 de deforestación. Sí, muy, muchas gracias, Miguel. Eh, a ver, te, veo a, a Jan. Jan, eh, adelante. Sí, muchas gracias, Steph, y bueno, a todos que han comentado. Eh, solamente un, un tema o destacar un poco el tema de MRC, de los mecanismos de retribución por servicios ecosistémicos, que se conocen los hídricos ¿no? en, en Perú. Uh, todavía no hay otros. Y bueno, hay una crítica ahí, ¿no? Uh, cada vez más que es, es medio unilateral, es decir, que es, es esa brecha de, de la parte urbana, rural, ¿no? Y um, bueno, Albrecht lo ha dicho lo he escuchado y creo que es importante tenerlo en cuenta, ¿no? Que, que no pase lo que ha pasado y lo que ahorita tenemos un poco la, el boomerang, en caso de Lima, por ejemplo, donde no se, no se logra implementar la, la gran mayoría de proyectos de siembra y cosecha de agua porque no necesariamente es lo que la gente de las comunidades en la Sierra de Lima quiere, ¿no? O sea, no de esa manera. Es, hay que balancearlo bien y, y de ahí hay, hay oportunidades, ¿no? En, también el tema de, de lo que estamos discutiendo. Eso solo por, eh, como comentario, ¿no? Para tenerlo en cuenta. Gracias. Sí, entonces hay un tema de comunicación y un tema de, de concertación eh, en la implementación de las intervenciones, ¿no? Que es súper importante. Muchas gracias. No sé si alguien tiene una, un último eh, comentario o pregunta. Si no, eh, tal vez, uh, maybe I'll switch to English. I'll, we're closing. Uh, eh, me, me, perdón, Steph, ah, ¿me sí, permites sí. una, sí, sí, claro, una pequeña eh, reflexión adicional? ¿no? Sí. Eh, eh, tú, tú me habías este, invitado a, a, a comentar un poco más sobre el tema de... de Cómo, cómo aprovechar esta experiencia de los alpaqueros para gestionar mejor los stocks de carbono, ¿no? Eh, yo, yo solo quiero recordar un dato. El MINAM, hace, hace pocas semanas, eh, que es el, el, el Ministerio del Ambiente en el Perú, es el que coordina el grupo intersectorial para las NDCs eh, y tratar de cumplir con los compromisos de reducción de emisiones, ¿no? Que en el Perú, un poco menos exigente que Colombia, tenemos... Eh, 30% con financiamiento de Perú y 10% adicional sujeto a financiamiento de la cooperación, ¿no? para llegar a 40%. Bueno, hoy, con todas las NDCs identificadas y sus prácticas y subprácticas, 
recién llegamos a 22% de reducción de emisiones. Entonces, falta todavía, hay una brecha muy grande, y entonces todos los sectores y todos los pisos ecológicos pueden, yo diría, deben contribuir. Entonces, el caso de Puna, con esos stocks de carbono bastante más grandes de lo que yo creo se pensaba hace no sé, cinco años o diez años, que ahora se está midiendo, eh, y, y bueno, Steph lo has demostrado bastante bien, ¿cómo podemos movilizar a la gente en la Puna para que nos ayuden a esto? ¿no? Ayudarse a ellos mismos, pero que también nos ayuden, ¿no? porque es un tema que de hecho lo, lo rebasa, o sea, ellos no tienen la responsabilidad de que la temperatura está subiendo, ¿no es cierto? Mm. Eso ya, ya, está, ya se dijo. Yo creo que ahí hay un tema de, de cómo podemos, eh, en, un, en un plazo retente corto, ayudarles a mejorar, o sea, ayudar a esas comunidades, y sobre todo los jóvenes, a mejorar la eficiencia de uso del agua y la eficiencia de uso de la energía. Eh, en, en, las, en la Puna hay entre 75 y 90% de migración. O sea, los jóvenes se van y quedan los, 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 los abuelos, los, los mayores, los niños. Los adultos se van porque simplemente no tienen fuente de ingreso suficiente para hacer familia. Entonces, sí necesitamos estos modelos de negocios donde principalmente van a vivir de los ingresos de su negocio y no del bono de carbono. El bono de carbono, los co-beneficios van a ser algo adicional y ojalá se pueda negociar en algún momento. ¿No es mm. cierto? Pero yo creo que su negocio, el core, del, del, del core of the business, es el que tiene que dar a esos jóvenes su ingreso eh, en, en, en tres o cinco años, más allá se van. Eso lo sí. hemos vivido en la cooperativa y sí. por eso que insisto en esto. Tenemos que apuntar a los jóvenes en prácticas de conservación, pero que esté directamente eh, anclada sobre su negocio y que sea rentable. Y se puede, ¿no? Se puede, pero hay que hacerlo. Gracias. Sí, muy, muy buen punto. Yo creo que ahí has tocado el medio del, del asunto, ¿no? Porque... Por una parte, digamos, Amazonía tiene mucho más visibilidad internacional ¿no? y, y es una preocupación incluso que se entremezcla en las elecciones en Brasil, pero la puna eh, sigue siendo un espacio olvidado a pesar que, que tiene niveles de riqueza, son los, los torres de agua, los, los stocks de carbono y toda la biodiversidad zoogenética y fitogenética se concentra ahí, ¿no? al menos de quinoa, papa, alpacas. Entonces son múltiples servicios. Entonces no solamente es un blended finance que se necesita o blended in initiatives, pero un provee blended como una mezcla de servicios ecosistémicos. Tal vez, tal vez el, 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 el 2026, que es el año internacional de Rangelands, en Pastor List eh, es un excelente momento para, para, para compartir más experiencias, ver cómo se puede, se puede tú, tú dijiste Albrí, que no se puede replicar, o es muy difícil de replicar en caso de, 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 caso de, los, de las alpacas, pero tal vez hay otros modelos que sí se puede replicar. Yo también estoy convencido que educación y asociatividad eh, junto con evidencias científicas y, y, y modelos de negocio, son, son, son como las cuatro patas del, 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 del esenciales para, para ir adelante. ¿no? Eh. Habría que preguntar a las empresas que están en el caso de Alpaca, eh, estoy hablando de Michel y, y Grupo Inca, porque son los dos únicos, ¿no? con 90% del mercado, ¿Qué piensan hacer para contribuir a las NDCs? ¿no? Que en sus proveedores de, de fibra promueven prácticas que contribuyan a las NDCs. ¿Qué piensan hacer? Uh -huh. Y si no es con ellos, posiblemente con las casas de moda o las casas, los compradores en, en Europa. ¿Quieres una cita con Bernard no? Es el dueño de Louis Vuitton. <ríe> ok, sí, vamos, vamos, vamos juntos. ¿Ah, sí? sí va. Por supuesto, yo no me pongo a, a este tipo de citas. Que tal vez podemos eh, explorar eso, ¿no? 
los grandes también pueden cambiar, a pesar que hay un tipo de monopolio. Pero... Uh, Jan, uh, ¿tú tienes la mano todavía arriba por, por un punto adicional? Uh, sí, sí uh, <ríe> me ha provocado la discusión respecto a la CNDC ¿no? y la visibilidad de, de la contribución de la alta montaña de su gente. Creo que es un, un, tema, un tema clave ¿no? que desde el Estado bueno, se ten, tendría que trabajar. Es como que se pierde ahí el, el vínculo. ¿no? Y la verdad no se valoriza, no se valoriza todavía el, el aporte que... Eh, bueno, lo hemos discutido en otro espacio en un momento, eh, Steph, y um, bueno, es un, es un desafío, ¿no? Es un desafío cambiar esas estructuras. Y, y bueno, con, solo como ejemplo, ¿no? En el tema del agua hay una desconexión bastante fuerte, ¿no? Entre el sistema, cómo um, las comunidades manejan el agua y lo que es el, la ANA, ¿no? O la Autoridad del Agua, um, Nacional del Agua. Entonces, algo parecido vemos en, 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 varios, en varios temas, ¿no? Y, eh, quizás con ese trabajo se, se, puede, se puede dar unas recomendaciones cómo se puede mejorar eso, ¿no? Con esas iniciativas, con eh, empresas privadas. Um, pero sí, es algo que se ve inclusive en gestión de riesgos, etcétera, en todo lo mismo. Eh, se, se está olvidando de, de esos aportes, ¿no? Eh, que son muy importantes eh, para, para todos los que están llegamos más cuenca abajo, ¿no? Sobre todo, y para el mismo Estado, para cumplir con las ND6, ¿no? Sí, eso, eso no más quise comentar, pero habría que discutirlo con más tiempo, seguramente. Sí, sí, la vez pasada pasó lo mismo. La discusión era tan, tan rica que todos teníamos ganas de, de continuar, pero después eh, la, hasta la traductora eh, tiró la toalla y eh, se, 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 se fue. Ahora estamos sin sin traductora, entonces, eh, eh, pero sí, vamos a continuar y el grupo Núcleo le va a tocar eh, tratar de destilar muchas de estas ideas en un white paper. Todos están invitados como coautores y de participar, pero el que vamos a, 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 a jalar el coche, eh, somos un grupo relativamente pequeño, entonces, todo, pero una vez que tenemos un borrador, eh, avanzado, lo compartimos con todos que han participado. Uh, maybe uh, before we close for the for the wider group, Mark, I still I see you are you are still online even though the we didn't have translation anymore. Thank you for uh, for staying online. I don't I don't know if you want to say a few words uh, to close uh, this session. Bueno, un placer. Yo podría entender la mayoría en, en español, entonces eh, hay un un, un poco problema porque en mi español me falta unas palabras de vez en cuando, pero podría entender la mayor parte. Um, eso fue una discusión muy interesante, muy rico, muchas diferentes cosas que uh, pensar. Um, lo que me, me da un poco de um, um, angustia, no sé, no sé la palabra en español, uh, pero es... Estoy buscando la manera en que se puede ganar dinero. Alguien que va a pagar los, los agricultores para hacer cosas diferentes. Y estamos discutiendo, discutiendo mucho de lo que puede hacer para cambiar el uso de Corbano. Pero el, la pregunta que yo tengo es, ¿quién va a pagar y cómo le van a pagar los, los agricultores para hacer cosas diferentes? para que lo sea mejor para uh, cuidar el, 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 el sequestration of, I, in English, the, the sequestration of carbon in the soils. Eso es el, el punto más importante, es cómo van a hacer cambiar los, los, los prácticos de los, de los agricultores para que sea más um, sostenible. And, and es, es una pregunta muy, muy difícil. No sé cómo uh, uh, responder a eso, pero eso es lo que nosotros estamos buscando, es qué podemos hacer diferente y 
qué, qué sistema necesitamos para que los agricultores puedan estar pagados para hacer cosas mejores para los suelos. Y estamos tratando de hacer esa cosa aquí en los Estados Unidos y en Brasil para que los agricultores grandes se puedan estar pagados para hacer cosas diferentes, uh, para secuestrar el carbono. Y yo quiero saber si es posible hacer la misma cosa para los uh, agricultores pequeños. Y eso es muy complejo y no sé cómo hacerlo, pero esa es la pregunta central de este, de este um, reto que estamos uh, tratando de, de hacer. Entonces, eso es um, mi, mi punto, solo mi punto, que yo no sé cómo hacerlo, pero eso es el, lo que queremos tratar de, de avanzar un poco para entenderlo mejor, para que los políticos y otros puedan hacer cambios en la, en la policy para aumentar una manera mejor para los agricultores ser más sostenible y, y uh, secuestrar el carbono. Y, um, yeah, eso es uh, lo único que puedo decir en ese momento, es que eso es um, un gran reto para nosotros todos. Y, y quiero que este white paper que estamos escribiendo trate de, de empezar paso a paso a lo que podemos hacer. ¿Dónde empezamos con ese um, gran um, viaje? Uh, porque necesitamos empezar en un, lugar, en un lugar, no sé dónde, pero poco a poco se tiene que seguir adelante en, en tratando de cambiar el sistema para que se pueden hacer cosas más rentables para los agricultores que sean más sostenibles para el carbono también. Y, um, yo pienso que eso es algo del gobierno, tiene que tener um, policy, uh, ¿cómo se dice? ¿Dice policías? Eh, eh, perdón, mi español. Uh, 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 políticas. Políticas, ok. Políticas. políticas uh, que, es, que sean um, mejores para... Uh, para para ser prácticos para los agricultores. Bueno, sí. eso es todo. No, no, nos has hecho recordar de, 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 de la razón de ser porque estamos juntos y, y, la, y el, el hilo central que queremos a, eh, enfocar en el, en el white paper. ¿no? Y, eh, y veo varias manos levantadas, pero... Creo que no hay un blueprint, pero algunas cosas que yo me llevo de esta discusión de hoy es asociatividad, eh, la forma de medir y cuantificar y trazabilidad, certificación, eh, concertación, eh, que, haya, que haya consulta eh, desde abajo hacia arriba en ambos lados eh, y qué puede hacer la diferencia para el mercado o la empresa que quiere invertir ¿Por qué hacerlo con agricultores pequeños en vez de hacerlo con uno grande? Yo creo que hay una mejor historia que contar. Eh, y esto tal vez es parte del social marketing y la comunicación. Pero creo que no hay un blueprint. Pero creo que no. lo que yo estoy viendo es que están saliendo varios, varios de los principios en esta discusión. Sí. Paso, paso a Ramiro, Javier eh, y Alberic. Creo que tenían las manos arriba. Eh, eh, otra vez marcas eh, provocado eh, reacción. Oh, sí. <ríe> sí. <ríe> Gracias, Steph. Mark realmente ha puesto el, 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 el dedo en la llaga, como decimos acá. ¿Cómo hacer que los pequeños eh, productores puedan cambiar sus, uh, sus conductas y sus... Uh, eh, eh, tareas habituales hacia algo nuevo, sabiendo que existe habitualmente resistencia al cambio, porque el sí. cambio puede llevarnos a riesgos que debemos eh, eh, evitar. Eh, yo, yo soy economista y yo creo en los incentivos. Y, y claramente hay, hay incentivos financieros y no financieros, que es lo que ha salido precisamente en las discusiones de hoy. Creo que los incentivos financieros los da el mercado a través de la mejora de ingresos mediante los bonos es una hipótesis. 
los incentivos no financieros es la mitad de la, de, de, de la ecuación. O sea, tenemos que encontrar cuáles son esos mecanismos no financieros que el mercado sí. no te los va a dar, que te los va a dar, no sé, políticas o otro tipo de tratamientos para, para evitar precisamente eh, un, una nueva frustración, que ya han habido muchas. Esencialmente, el, el tema de la formalidad, por ejemplo, es, es, es crítica. Cuando estamos hablando de contratos y de que en 10 años la tierra no va a cambiar drásticamente, si estamos hablando de, de agricultura regenerativa, etcétera, etcétera, y certificación de, 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 de fijación y de, de, de carbón y reducción de emisiones, eh, son parámetros muy rigurosos. Pero todo esto tiene que estar, obviamente, dentro de los incentivos. De lo contrario, no se van a cambiar conductas y los incentivos tienen que ser muy positivos. Con esto termino. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Ramiro. Eh, Javier y eh, Billy, eh, Albrick, no sé si has bajado la, la mano, parece. Okay. Eh, o, o... ¿Me, ¿Me escuchan sí. bien ahí? Eh, sí. Disculpe. Sí. Adelante, Javier, sí. Ok, muchas gracias con todos. Este, mi nombre es Javier Ochoa y, y fui parte de este equipo que, que visitó a las comunidades. Y dando seguimiento a lo que, que menciona el colega Ramiro, es muy importante eh, los, esos incentivos que, que motiven a las familias que enfrentan estas realidades a, a conservar estos espacios, ¿no? Eh, muy importante también hablar de la segunda generación que viene atrás de ellos, que ven oportunidades en la minería, oportunidades en centros urbanos aledaños que cada vez van creciendo. Este, eh, yo para acotar y, y mi, mi, esta idea, considero que, que como cada comunidad mantiene una realidad, hay que adaptar estas, sol estas soluciones a lo largo de esta, este gran ecosistema que tan olvidado como es la puna, donde existen no solamente estudios de cuantificación a nivel de estas profundidades, sino a más profundidades y también de otros tipos de carbono, el carbono aéreo, biomasas de cojines, vegetales. Existe una gran información que ya, ya cuantifica en, en, en varias regiones a, ni, a, nivel, a nivel nacional y en esta, en esta región. Entonces, eh, me, tener al, a esta especie con motor eh, y dentro de, de que sea imagen para generarle beneficios a estas poblaciones tiene que estar basadas en sus necesidades y frente a lo que ya se está, se está viendo en temas sociales como una segunda generación que no va a estar presente y también yo este, les puedo adelantar algunos, este, algunos estudios que eh, he, he leído y me han, me han sido comentados, ¿no? El, a nivel de extensión de áreas de bofedales, muchos estudios en zona de Cusco o Sangate muestran que, que los bofedales en área es, eh, no, quizás no se están reduciendo como se esperaría, ¿no? Pero más bien las pasturas están perdiendo calidad en retener este, agua o en retener este, mi, este, minerales, ¿no? Como, como el carbono, ¿no? Entonces, hay que, hay, que tener esos, hay que tener ese sentido de urgencia para responder estas, lo que, estas este, necesidades, ¿no? Muchas gracias ante todo este, por, por, este, por participar acá. Sí, excelente comentario, Javier. Muchas gracias, Billy. Sí, gracias. Este. Sí, estoy muy de acuerdo con todos los comentarios. Realmente, la asociatividad es un tema clave, los incentivos también, pero hay un tema que quisiera agregar que es el tema de la, la, el reconocimiento de las necesidades y las diferencias, necesidades que tienen los diferentes grupos. Uh, en las últimas semanas he estado viajando a, al Perú a hacer unos diagnósticos para la iniciativa GRILAC y uno de los uh, 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 y de, de las temas que hemos identificado es que comunidades más alejadas tienen necesidades diferentes o más uh, aisladas, tienen necesidades diferentes a comunidades y, y zonas que están más conectadas a la ciudad. Por ejemplo, cuando hicimos uh, sobre qué cosa querían desarrollar, 
las que estaban más conectadas, el desarrollo estaba en nivel de capacitación, apiculación, nuevos mercados, estaban adaptados al cambio. Comunidades más alejadas querían simplemente que las cosas vuelvan a ser como eran antes y volver a hacer lo que siempre habían hecho, porque no sabían que era, o no confiaban en el mercado, o no saben qué cosa es una capacitación de calidad, no hay instituciones sólidas que les permitan vincular, así que ellos buscaban de cierta forma uh, que les solucionen el problema de agua. El problema de agua, al menos estos meses, es el problema más crítico que tienen uh, los agricultores en el Perú. Y, y ellos pedían, no pedían capacitación, solo pedían construyanos uh, uh, reservorios, construyanos cochas, uh, canales, y nosotros nos encargamos del resto. No necesitamos nada más. Entonces hay una necesidad de diferenciar que no todos son iguales, no todas las necesidades son iguales y que nuestros paquetes de intervenciones tienen que estar adaptadas a, la, a las condiciones propias de, de diferentes zonas y diferentes tipos de productores. Gracias. Gracias, Willy. Eh, Alberic y David. Estás en mute, eh, Albrecht. Claro, gracias. Eh, sí, quiero volver sobre un, un comentario. Existe que, o quizás me exprese mal, que, que iba a ser imposible eh, replicar a lo que ha hecho Copecán. Eh, no, no, no es imposible. Eh, hay un camino, hay varias rutas para hacerlo. Pero para eso necesitamos algo, lo cual nos hemos un, un poco olvidado en la charla ahora, es eh, que en el marco legal, eh, cambien y mejoren algunas cosas. Uno, la ley de cooperativas agrarias. Ha sido el trabajo de años, de, de grupos de gente muy experimentada en el tema de cooperativas. Me, me refiero a cooperativas de segunda generación, las que tienen gestión empresarial, ¿no? o sea, de tipo empresarial, aunque no, una cooperativa no es una empresa. Esa ley ha sido promulgada por Pedro Castillo, apenas tomó sus funciones el año pasado, pero no hay reglamento. Tenemos 18 meses esperando un reglamento y debido a eso no se puede formar nuevas cooperativas con los famosos incentivos, eh, sobre lo cual eh, el, el colega eh, mencionó, y lo cual estoy totalmente de acuerdo, se necesitaba incentivos tributarios. ¿no? ¿Para qué agruparse si no tengo ninguna ventaja? Porque agruparse también cuesta. Entonces tengo que tener más ventajas que desventajas de agrupar. Para eso está esa ley y no está activa, la necesitamos, uno. Y lo otro, necesitamos que el, el Estado también deje de cobrar cosas a la gente eh, sin justificación. Y ahí retomaré el caso de, de Jan, Jan Becker, sobre el tema del agua. Hace más o menos un mes estuve en Arequipa, en la reserva Salinas Sagua Blanca, y me dio la sorpresa que las comunidades se quejaban que Lana les quería cobrar el agua. Eh, con el cuento de que el agua es pública y que la ley es la misma para todos, entonces la, las comunidades en la parte alta generan el agua para Equipa y le quieren cobrar por el agua que usan. ¿no? 1.500 soles en eh, cada comunidad. O sea, eso es el colmo. Entonces, quiere decir que en el Estado hay gente que no piensa. O sea, la ley, está bien que la ley sea la misma para todos, pero hay que diferenciar también las cosas. ¿no? Tiene que haber un poco más de racionalidad. Y hay dos ejemplos, el agua y la ley de cooperativas. Ninguno de los dos funciona bien el marco legal. Entonces, se necesita ahí también un trabajo eh, para poder facilitar nuestro propio trabajo, en este caso eh, estoy hablando de la puna, pero estoy seguro que en la, la Amazonía es lo mismo, eh, y de paso en la zona alto andina hasta el año 2020, eh, 31 de diciembre de 2020, había una ley de exoneración, eh, de pago de IGB para las empresas que están... Eh, eh, bueno, según el tipo de empresa, de arriba de 2.500 o 3.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar, y esa ley, que duró 10 años, venció con el argumento eh, de algún estudioso, dijo que no había traído ningún beneficio. Bueno, no trajo ningún beneficio para él, posiblemente, pero para quien crea una empresa en la zona alto andina y desde el primer sol tiene que pagar toda la carga tributaria, obviamente nunca va a poder crecer ese negocio. Entonces, actualmente las empresas que se mantienen son las que fueron creadas hace años pero no se puede crear eh, un pequeño negocio sin incentivo y menos aún en zona alto andina con las condiciones difíciles en lo cual están 
ciertas empresas por alejamiento del mercado y por muchas otras razones. ¿no? Entonces, hay, un, hay un tema en el marco legal eh, en el Perú, estoy llamando aquí del Perú, que complica eh, la posibilidad de tener impacto más rápido. Y esa, ese, son condiciones habilitantes, ¿no? igual como la infraestructura, también el marco legal. Y no hay que cerrarse los ojos. Eh, y ahí hay que hacer la pelea junto con las organizaciones, porque solo organizados eso se va a resolver. De uno en uno, eh, la tecnología es muy bonita, ¿no? De, de, de agricultor en agricultor, pero si no se organizan, no va a pasar nada. Esa es otra lección aprendida. Gracias. Sí. Gracias. David. Quería comentar algo muy, muy, muy breve, a razón del tiempo. Este, básicamente, una de las cosas que, que, que sale de aquí, de lo que hemos venido digamos, este, escuchando, es que no hay una fórmula mágica ¿no? para todo. ¿no? Es decir, hay un contexto dependiente, Willy lo remarca en relación a las tipologías que existen de agricultores, sobre todo cuando hablamos de ecosistemas tan complejos como los sistemas andinos eh, eh, con alta heterogeneidad. ¿no? Entonces, hay un componente importante. Y desde lo que he aprendido también acá, cuando, cuando escucho a gusto, ¿no? este, hablar de todos los pasos que hay que llevar a cabo ¿no? Para, y que de repente la, la medición, eh, que yo como biólogo pues es el que hago, ¿no? es digamos el último paso de toda esa cadena, ¿no? la importancia de ya del modelo de, de, ¿no? de, de mercado ¿no? que hay. Y entonces allí yo pongo una reflexión, de repente para que sirva como insumo, eh, es que eh, ya han habido también casos, creo yo, exitosos, Voy a acercar el tema de papa, el tema de papa, ¿no? Con el caso de las papas nativas, ¿no? Este, hace algunos años no se valora, pero ahora, ahora incluso hay un modelo de negocios que nosotros, como, como bueno, eh, digamos, habitantes de ciudades, podemos adquirir papas nativas, ¿no? Y, y entonces eh, uno va pensando y dice, bueno, pues eh, ya han habido entonces de cadenas de valor que se han ido, que han ido beneficiando, digamos, a, a pequeños agricultores, ¿no? ¿Podemos entonces engancharnos a su vez de esas cadenas de valor que ya existen y que están comenzando a tomar fuerza, ¿no? Para poder a su vez eh, poner, digamos, eh, el tema ambiental, ¿no? Este, en caso de, de, de reducciones, pues, de, 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 de emisiones, por ejemplo. ¿no? Hablar de una, tenemos octógonos de, de nutricionales, pero un octo, un, soñando un poco, ¿no? Octógonos de beneficio al medio ambiente, octógonos que tengan inclusión social, ¿no? Ojalá que el consumidor algún día pueda valorar también eso, ¿no? Este, yo pienso que, que hay cadenas de valores que se han ido activando, incluso que se han ido fortaleciendo con la pandemia, ¿no? Este, y, que, y que de repente eh, pueden servirnos a su vez como para poder sumar a lo que Mark comentaba en relación al beneficio de los agricultores con prácticas que eh, reduzcan emisiones. Esa sería mi reflexión, este. Gracias. Sí, y solamente como un dato final con lo que acaba de decir David, hay un buen documento del Banco Mundial de 2018 que hace un análisis de agricultura peruana y mete un concepto que es descomoditizar algo así, algunos productos peruanos como el café y cacao y buscar nichos de mercado e incluye a lo que hicimos en Papas Nativas en Perú como un caso en ese libro, porque es una cadena que si bien es cierto no llega a la exportación, bueno, ahora ya llegó a la exportación final, pero es una forma de haber llegado a mercados amplios y a una diferenciación comercial muy concreta. Entonces, eh, hay rutas, el reto simplemente es ver cuál es el valor adicional que el consumidor final va a reconocer para pagar por esto. ¿Qué es lo que pasaba cuando hicimos el tema de las papas nativas? ¿no? Ahora, todos ustedes saben, un kilo de papa blanca se vende a un sol, un kilo de papa amarilla se vende a dos soles y un kilo de papa nativa a cuatro soles. Y eso va aumentando. Pero quien lo definió fue el consumidor final. Y eso creo que es el principal argumento para que todo esto funcione. Por eso le preguntaba a Alberic y a la, los, 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 los muchachos de Cacao, es cuál es el segmento de mercado final, porque... Hay que identificar quién paga todo esto. Las políticas, todo lo demás ayudan, pero si no hay quien pague esto, el tema no va a dar, ¿no? A ver, ya para ya cerrar con broche de oro. A ver, sí. <risa> no, eh, no sí. me corresponde, pero sí. sí, es justo el comentario de 
o sea, el último comentario ahorita, que, eh, claro, hay que visibilizar y hasta que se tiene que personalizar también, ¿no? Um, yo, bueno, <ríe> claro, es, el contexto es muy diferente, pero, bueno, yo soy de Suiza y, bueno, ustedes saben que uh, creo que la agricultura no podría sobrevivir sin esas uh, subvenciones del Estado y toda la cadena que es básicamente son productos uh, ecológicos, uh, biológicos, uh, se llaman también, ¿no? Y uh, se personaliza eso, ¿no? Y llegamos, uh, creo que eso, eso hace también falta acá y es justamente por esos problemas uh, estructurales que hemos hablado antes, uh, que que no se cuenta la historia detrás, excepto con esos buenos ejemplos que hemos visto de, del CIP, ¿no? por ejemplo, eh, donde sí la, se logró que la papa nativa, digamos, um, si sí, tenía ahí una cadena, digamos, ¿no? hasta cierto punto, en algunos productos, uh, no de primera necesidad, digamos, hablando de chips, ¿no? pero uh, ese es un buen ejemplo. Y, y creo que si sí, ahí hay un tema que que habría que, como, como dice Albert, que luchar también y desde las comunidades, desde los productores, que verdaderamente se hacen visible, ¿no? Con una ayuda, ayuda de las instituciones. Um, y ahí, claro, debería estar el Estado también, que no siempre está, eso sabemos, ¿no? Pero, bueno, ahí hay que tratar de uh, encontrar las entradas, ¿no? Sí, para sí. promover eso. Gracias. Sí, gracias. Y creo que el reto para el equipo Núcleo que va a escribir y tratar de juntar las experiencias y la información es justamente ver los, el, el paisaje total, ¿no? Porque tenemos, digamos, lo que se puede internalizar a la cadena en sí. Tenemos el, el entorno habilitador, que son las políticas eh, y... Eh, la, la, la organización y tenemos uh, el insetting por una parte y el offsetting por otra parte y ten, también tenemos uh, cadenas que son nacional más informal donde posiblemente el, el volumen es mayor pero la informalidad también es mayor y tenemos uh, las cadenas uh, de exportación cacao uh, fibra que probablemente el el sistema de incentive y el consumidor final uh, y la cadena está más dispuesta a, a pagar ciertos, ciertos bonos. Uh, entonces, este, este juntar, estoy en, en mi cabeza pensando en un tipo de infografía, un tipo de, de forma de captar uh, estos diferentes elementos. ¿no? Uh, pero sí, uh, tal vez lo que lo que quiero decir es, eh, aparte que Holanda está ganando, yo soy de origen holandés y, y eh, a, a, ahora Holanda está con 2 a 0 contra Qatar, pero estamos casi ganando, pero era fácil este partido. Pero eh, decir que, que agradezco mucho todos los aportes, yo, yo he sentido que es, fue, fue muy, eh, muy rico estas dos semanas que hemos tenido. Yo creo que queda el compromiso en el grupo núcleo que va a escribir de compartir eh, el borrador con el grupo ampliado para respetar también todos los insumos y el interés que ustedes han tenido de, de participar. Este más realísticamente lo veo para, para enero, eh, eh, para tener un primer borrador que, que compartir. Eh, agradecer también por la confianza de Bayer eh, de, de motivarnos en, en este proceso y, eh, y estimular que estamos eh, los tres centros CG juntos eh, y tal vez eh, para los que son parte del grupo núcleo para escribir si se pueden quedar eh, unos minutos más para organizarnos para mañana eh, sin más que decir pues, agradecerles a, a todos y, y otra vez eh, yo aprendí un montón en estas dos horas y media. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Entonces, a todos que tengan bueno, una buena tarde. Bueno. Muchas gracias. gracias. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Cuídense mucho. Gracias por la invitación. Adiós. Hasta luego.
Y, y qué bien que esté ganando Holanda, hombre. Sí. Muchas gracias a todos. Un abrazo, sí. chao. Un abrazo, chao, chao. Chao, chao. A usted. Steph, ¿me escucha? Sí, Viviana, te escucho. Ya. Sí, sí eh, solamente para confirmar eh, quiénes son el... ¿Quiénes son los que integran el grupo de mañana para poder eh, cambiar eh, la hora de la reunión? Somos un grupo muy pequeño, si no, David lo tiene creo más claro. Sí, pero... Está Miguel, Miguel sí. que está aquí, Miguel Romero, Samuel Flores, de sí, ¿no? yeah. este, Jan Baker, que está aquí. Mucho gusto, Jan. ¿eh? De igual manera. Gracias, David. <risa> este y, y yo. Ya, entonces estamos Miguel, Samuel, Jan, Steph y David, ¿cierto? Sí, nosotros sí. somos el grupo, el grupo núcleo, sí. Perfecto. Lo que sucede es que vamos a tener que cambiar, modificar la hora, eh, retrasarla una hora, porque tenemos una reunión de staff el día de mañana y tenemos...